I got you. Oh, hamstring. Oh, <laughs> sniper, take the other picture. Yeah, I mean, that's how, that's how you can formulate opinions without having true facts. I'm telling you, think about it logically for just a second. Dear Reds fans, welcome back to the Zebra Zillionaires. It was a tough one yesterday. Live from Chatterbox Sports Studios, it's Off the Bench with Tom Brenneman. Well, good morning, good morning, and a pleasant good Wednesday morning. They call this hump day, and right here in Chatterbox Studios, it is very much running into all kinds of humps and bumps. I'm Tom Brenneman. We welcome you to Off the Bench, presented by our good friends. No problems with these guys from United Dairy Farmers. We come your way Monday through Friday, 10 hey. to 12 p.m. And that's Eastern time. You can join us on Chatterbox Sports. That's our page on YouTube. Or you can download us in podcast form. Just search Off the Bench with Tom Brenneman and you're dialed in. You know, there's nothing like walking into work on a Wednesday you get everything ready, you sit down, you write your monologue, make sure we're all good on what we're doing for the show. And then all of a sudden, like three minutes before the show, uh, teleprompter, dead. Uh, think pad, dead. Dumb pad, they ought to call it. Think pad, dead. Dead. And then 10 seconds before we go on the air, Reed Mouse wants to start talking about somebody bad-mouthing me on local radio. Now, do you think that, let's say, Tori Lovello planted a seed of doubt in Brandon Fott's mind last night as he walked to the mouth? Hey, brother, they got, some, they got some hammers on that team now. Don't make that mistake. Don't give up that long ball on the first pitch. I'm, I'm sure he probably did that. Um, nope, we'll get to this oh, okay, later. Okay, okay. Later, later. Right, we have a guest right, right, right. waiting. The Bengals are back at it in full force at Paycor after their bye week. Now, they're preparing for Sunday's game against the 49ers. That's a 425 Eastern time kick from Santa Clara on Sunday. And you know about the Niners. They started 5-0. They've lost their last two to Cleveland and Minnesota. Orlando Brown, T. Higgins, Cheeto Awuzie, all expected to be back at full strength or close to full strength after all were injured two weeks ago in the win over Seattle. Colts owner Jim Ursay says the NFL admits and understands, that's a quote, admits and understands that two pivotal calls at the end of his team's loss to Cleveland were incorrect calls. There was an illegal contact call, pass interference call in the final minute, which allowed Cleveland to score a touchdown with 15 seconds left in the game. And there you have it. You imagine that? They admit and understand. <laughs> Meanwhile, your team took a loss on a game you should have won. Terrible. Uh, Ursay also announced that Anthony Richardson, their number one pick from this past year's draft, the quarterback, underwent shoulder surgery yesterday in Los Angeles. He's expected to miss the rest of the season. I tell you, this Michigan thing, uh, every single day, seemingly a new twist and turn, and it's not good for Michigan football. We already know that Connor Stallions bought tickets to upcoming games, opponents games inside the Big Ten. They have video of him recording the opposing sideline. They have video of all of it. Stadium video of this guy doing it. Rules clearly tell you since 1994, you can't scout other teams in person in college football and you can't video a team's sideline. Well, then last night, ESPN reports, ho, 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 the 12 bid 10 schools weren't enough for Connor Stallions. He bought tickets on the secondary market to attend the last two SEC championship games and a number of other potential college football opponents that Michigan could play. I can promise you there are a lot of people in that Michigan Wolverine athletic department today that are walking around on serious eggshells. This potentially is a bombshell story in college football. All right, baseball. And we're going to get to Marty Brenneman here in a matter of minutes. Only one guy in this room said, watch out for the D-backs. I'm not going to say who that is. It was me. 
but it's only one guy. But if there is someone out there who was betting the Diamondbacks when the playoffs started to get to the World Series, their odds were 125 to 1. The Rangers were 50 to 1. Then please lock up with Z Brazilianaire if you made those bets. After Texas throttles Houston in Game 7 two nights ago in the ALCS, the Diamondbacks chopped down and shut down the once mighty Philadelphia Phillies advancing to their second World Series in franchise history. Corbin Carroll, quiet most of the series, was 3-for-23. Last night, the best player on the field. Not even debatable. He has three hits, knocks in two runs, steals a couple of bases, scores a couple of runs. The Diamondbacks came back from 2-0 in the series, 3-2 in the series, and hand the Phillies losses in back-to-back games where they had not lost at home this entire postseason. Game one is Friday night in Arlington, Texas. I know Marty Brenneman, the Hall of Famer, was dialed in last night for the mighty D-backs and the Phils. You and I talked on the phone yesterday, and you told me this is Philadelphia's game, no doubt about it. Yeah, I did. And I'll stand by that. Just like I said, the Reds were going to be 68-94 on opening day last year. (laughs) Um And I echo the sentiments of a lot of people going into that game last night that Philadelphia was going to win. I am very impressed with the the Diamondbacks. And and I, quite honestly, um, I understand Texas is favored to win the World Series. Uh, If I were Texas, uh, the way the Diamondbacks are playing right now, I'd be scared to death having to play that team because of the way they've approached – this postseason, they beat a better team on paper in the Dodgers. Uh, they beat uh, a better team on paper in Philadelphia. And here they are. And so, um, uh, you know, I'm very, very impressed. The way that kid pitched last night, even though he only pitched four innings, and it should be pointed out that he is a native of Louisville, Kentucky, yep. and he went to Bellarmine College in Louisville. And that's where he pitched and was drafted uh, in Major League Baseball. So, not a local kid, but certainly a kid that's uh, uh, born and raised only a couple of hours away from here. And congratulations to him and the job he did last night, along with that outstanding bullpen uh, that Arizona runs out there on a nightly basis. Um, I, you know, a lot of people last night on social media and today on social media, we were talking about this in the studio before we went on the air. There are a lot of Reds fans out there that are saying that could have been us. Because when yeah. you look at the players on paper, I mean, I got to tell you, I mean, I think Arizona has some gamers on that team. I mean, guys that you may not know. I know Perdomo went to the All Star game this year, but he's not a household name. Uh, uh, Cattell Marte's a stud. End of story. Total stud. And their catcher's a stud. And we know about Carroll. But, uh, I mean, what do you say when people say that could have, would have, could have, should have been the Reds? Well, to begin with, I'm tired of talking about it. Uh, I, I've, exta- I've stated my position on that. Uh, I know local radio talk show hosts uh, had to stick it into Nick Crawl because of the performance of Seawald and and uh, uh, what's his name? The Alpha Tommy, Tommy Fam. Fam, yeah. And, and they did what uh, this was basically what he said. They, they did what uh, the Reds did not do. And again, I'm shocked that people continue to say that. When Nick Crawl came out a week ago in a very, very upfront and 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 brutally honest, uh, no holes barred, not holding anything back position, when he talked about the players that the teams that he was negotiating with leading up to the trade deadline wanted in return for his uh, for a pitcher, and when you see that the Giolito they wanted Matt McLean and uh, I forget who else it might have been Marte I don't know, but it were two players that were pivotal in terms of the future of this franchise. And you're rolling the dice. You know, Seawall did the job. Tommy Pham hit a home run the other night. So what? He batted 242 after he got traded over to the damn Arizona Diamondbacks. So, um, you know, I just say, you know, you need something to talk about. So go ahead and do it. I had to do it all over again. I'm going to say it one more time. I don't want anybody to ask me about it again because I've been very upfront from the get-go, even before the deadline. I would not trade any of those players in order to get a pitcher that you think or or might be successful in getting you over the hump. Might be, might. 
And Lucas Giolito, he got he was he stunk where he was pitching. He got traded to the White Sox, and he stunk with the White Sox. Yeah. Why the hell would you want to bring him in here, especially for Matt McClain and some other position player on this ball club that's going to be an outstanding performer? I don't disagree one bit with what Nick Kroll did, and 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 God bless these guys because they have nothing else to talk about, so they got to talk well, about that. Well, I'm done now wait, that. well, wait a minute now. I mean, you're my dad, and when you tell me to do something or not do something, as you well know, uh, I, I listen to those words of wisdom frequently, not all the time, but frequently growing up, and even now. You're at, not all the time is right. Most of the time, not. Okay, well, here here's the deal. Okay, here's the deal. You... you, you Everything you just said is, hello, Millie. Good morning, Millie. Hey, I know. <laughs> Millie is, uh, is, is trying to lead the Abraham Accords here to try and, and balance this show out a little bit. But I, <laughs> listen, you can't, you can't deny what is a fact. And that is, it wasn't at the trade deadline. It was actually after the trade deadline when the Diamondbacks went out and got FAM and went out and got Seawall. Now, you can say, well, see, well, well, it changed their entire bullpen, the way they stack them up from the ninth, Correct. the eighth, the seventh. Okay. And they only gave up one prospect who was ranked 30th in their system. Now, look, I think you can have it both ways here. I, I believe Nick Crawl when he says these other teams wanted for Giolito or whomever else was out there, Jordan Montgomery, that they wanted Steer or Encarnacion Strand or Marte or whoever it was, McLean, and, and you're not going right. to make that move. I think everybody agrees with that. But I, I think somebody would be fair in asking, wait a minute now, you gave up your 30th best prospect to get a closer that had blown three saves all year long after the deadline? The Reds had guys in the bullpen running on fumes at the end of the year. I think it's a fair question. Well, I don't think it's a fair question. I, well, again, it's just like all the rest of them, you're the same way. you got nothing else to talk about, so you well, want to talk about this. That's true. They, don't you think for one second that when, when the White Sox said, well, in order to trade Giolito to you, we've got to have Matt McClain and whoever else, uh, don't you think Nick Kroll tried to get Giolito for a lesser amount I mean, it, all you got to do is use a little logic. Right. He sure as hell was not going to trade these guys. So he had to counter or, or initially make an offer that obviously the teams that he was talking with uh, did not find attractive enough to get rid of a pitcher who stunk. Um, so I, I don't I, – I, I think it's, it's, it's a tired subject. I think it's over and done with. Why continue to harp on something that's over and done with? Nick Kroll, for my money, should be uh, executive of the year yep, in the I National agree. League. I agree with uh, that. So for, to, to lambaste him because of what he didn't do, what, how, how the hell do you think it would have been had they, had, in a weak moment, he had dealt one or two of those guys? No, 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 no. You're, you're not. You're, you're not. You're, you're missing the point that I asked you about. I, conceded, I know what your point is. I conceded to you beforehand that I wouldn't have traded any of those guys for anybody, I wouldn't have traded McLean or Encarnacion Strand or Marte or Steer. I wouldn't have traded any of those guys for Justin Verlander. I wouldn't have made that deal. But I think it is fair to say that at some point in time, the Arizona general manager was able to talk to the Seattle general manager. And I'm leaving Tommy Pham out of this because the Reds didn't want him anyway. You're right. But I'm saying, you know, if those two general managers got on the phone after the trade deadline and the Diamondbacks only had to give up their 30th best prospect, how were they able to do that and the Reds weren't? There had to be a like deal I to be made a somewhere. Local radio, like I told a local radio talk show host, you are comparing apples to oranges here. They get Seawall for a 30th round pick. I would ask you this question. At the time that that deal was made, did anybody consider that Arizona might be in the postseason? Not a hell of a lot of people. Not a whole lot of people mm. felt that. The time well, that they did. trade was made. But they did. Huh? They were right there. They were right there all along, right in that group, bunched together. Philadelphia had I don't a, think. a significant lead. And you had Arizona, the Reds, the Cubs were the leaders before their collapse. You had the Cubs, the Reds, the Diamondbacks, the Giants were right in the middle of all that. Right, I mean, that's they were right. All right there, and I would say to you that Arizona, among that group of teams, 
was an afterthought among most people. Fair if enough. If they're honest. Fair enough. So I, I, I think you're comparing apples to oranges. I think a okay. lot of people, a lot of people felt that the Reds were going to hang in till the end. I think the teams that Nick talked to, or were teams that felt this team, this team does have a chance to get there, a legitimate chance. So why the heck should we take peanuts uh, for a guy that's going to put them? We got them right where we want them, and so it's either they give us a, a boatload for a guy who may or may not help them get to the postseason, or they go lacking. Uh, so I don't, I don't have a problem at all with that stuff. And I, like I said, I think you and the rest of these guys need something to talk about. So you want to talk about that now? And let me make another point while I'm thinking about <laughs> yeah. it, because being 81 years old. I can forget from moment to moment. Well, a lot of people in the chat yeah. are very worried about you. They think you're getting so riled up that you're bordering on being called back into the commissioner's office. But please go ahead. I'm just going to keep an eye on you. Casey, get ready to hit the dump button just in case. Go ahead. No, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change up on you and then let you get back to this tired subject if you have anything else to say about it. <laughs> I found interesting your comments about this ongoing scandal at the University of Michigan. And my point is this. Let's see what the NCAA does about this whole thing. The most right. worthless organization on the, in the history of God's earth. They are absolutely worthless, that organization. Let's see how long it takes them to come to some type of conclusion that Michigan is guilty as a day is long uh, with this Connor Stallions business. And I think this, nobody will ever convince me that he took it all on himself. I know they've suspended him with pay. So it makes the school look like, hey, this guy did it without the knowledge of anybody. If somebody feels that way legitimately, that there were coaches on that staff that did not know what was going on, I got a bridge I want to sell. It. But let's see how long it takes the NCAA, who's absolutely worthless, to come up with some solution to this problem. Now well, I'm done know, with that. Well, you know, no, no, no. I mean, you bring up something, though, which we didn't have a chance to talk with you because you were up in Nova Scotia running around with all the, you know, in, in, <laughs> you being the man of the high seas. Uh, you know, you're up there and, and doing your thing. And I get it. Yeah, I, I know. It. That's right. Um, kayaking and, you know, all that kind of thing. But yeah, that's right. Um, they, but, 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 you know, we didn't have a chance to get into back to the NCAA and my good friend Trace Fowler who is one of the all-time great front runners? You know, he, he grew up in, in Hamilton, Here Ohio, but he's a Kansas go. basketball fan. He's here a Georgia oh. football fan. I mean, it, it, it's, Get it's, out it's, of here. It's, it's sickening. Anyway, point I'm making is, I mean, look, I know you're a buddy of Bill Self. You guys are pals. You hang out at concerts together at Hootie and the Blowfish and all that kind of stuff, right? I, I, I'm not lying about this. This is the truth. You hung out with him at, 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 at the dude who's ahead of Hootie and the Blowfish. You hung out with him in a concert. I was it was one night. I don't care. You're running around with all the elitists, all the big boys. But in all seriousness, how in the world can a program like college, like Kansas have five level one infractions? Five of them. They're the worst infractions you can have, level one. How in the world can that happen and the only thing they do is take down a banner about a Final Four appearance? I mean, seriously. it goes back to what it goes back to what I said a minute ago about the NCAA. They're worthless. They they know more uh, police. The group of college, universities and colleges that come under their umbrella uh, as far as their infractions committee is concerned. Uh, I mean, they're just they they don't they don't do anything that amounts to the crime that's leveled against the school. Um uh, hey, Kansas ain't the only one. I hate to right. say it, but there would there are those who would tell you that my beloved alma mater, the University of North Carolina, was guilty as hell a few years ago when they had these classes that were going on uh, that that they, they were guys were given grades that they didn't earn and the whole scandal that went on in Chapel Hill, and they got off with nothing. And there are people down there that would tell you today that that was one of the most uh, egregious things that the NCAA has, never, has ever done, uh, not penalizing North Carolina to the extent that they should have been. Now, I don't know whether it's true or not, but I'm just telling you, this is the, this is the kind of thing that goes on that the NCAA uh, doesn't do itself any favor because they come up with solutions or they make announcements concerning impending uh, 
uh, penalties that should be imposed on schools based on the evidence, and they give them nothing but a slap on their wrist. So I, 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 I just everything they do reinforces what I uh, feel about that organization in Indianapolis. All right, let's circle around the room uh, if we can. Let's start with the zebra. Elliot, anything for the Hall of Famer today? You want to get into what the Reds did at the trade deadline or didn't do or any of that kind of thing? If you weren't listening, we talked about that. But if you want to circle back, you're more than welcome. No, I'm good, Tom. Hey, hey, Marty, <clears throat> this is Elliot here. I, I want to ask you real quick, if that's okay. I haven't won. I haven't won a bet in about three and a half weeks. Do you have any winners for me in the coming weeks? Any winners for you? Yeah, I just need a winner. I need you to give me a bet that I can take, maybe for the World Series that I can just take and I could bet, and, and, and if I win it, I'll, I'll give the money back to you. Uh, no, I really don't. No? I don't have anything. Okay. No. All right. I, I All wish right. I could help you, Elliot, I, because I know you're searching and I know you're yeah, uh, struggling. you're reaching for something. Well, well do you got do you got anything any any action on the NBA tonight? <laughs> I didn't have any action on the NBA last night. That's fair. I, That's I watched fair. the uh, ring. I watched the ring presentation to the players on the Denver team, uh, and I saw them raising the banner. And then at that point, I switched over to watch Game Seven. Okay, but I watched right. a little bit. Yes. I, I, you know, I'm not a big NBA fan. I know you are. Uh, you're one of the misguided millions in this country that think it's great. <laughs> um, and I, I can appreciate that. But as far as my interest is concerned, that train left a long time ago. Okay. And I have one last one before I, sh I throw it to Regis. One last serious sports question here. I think LeBron's <laughs> far better than Michael Jordan. Do you agree? No, I do not. But that's fine. I, <laughs> once again, you're misguided. Uh, you're you're uh, a modern day NBA fan, you weren't. You were crapping down your leg when Michael Jordan was doing the things that he did to make him the best player in the history of the game. Uh, well, so I understand that. Yeah, a uh, lot of and so I, I take I take what you and other people say with a grain of salt. I yeah. just, you know, a lot of I'm people, good with that. Yeah, that's fair. A lot of people do say Michael was going up against mailmen and plumbers, though. They were all working second second jobs. <laughs> oh, come they on. Come, Give me a break. <laughs> good Lord. That's right. I, I'm good with that. I, you know, I understand how misguided people would make stupid statements like that. Um, and I'd be less than honest if I didn't say you fall into that same category. But that's a problem. That's, fair. that's a problem that you have to deal with. That's a cross that you have to bear. And, uh, you know, you'll live long enough so that people like me are going to be gone. And the only thing that people can learn about Michael Jordan is reading it in books. And so they would readily agree with your assessment. And that's good. That's fine. Okay. That's all I had. Marty, thank you. And, love, and, I, and I love you as well. Go back to reading. Read. I love you too, Ali. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. Uh, hey, Marty. Um, you know, you were talking briefly there about the NCAA. And obviously, uh, you share, share the same sentiment as most of us do. We don't like the NCAA. We think it's a toothless organization. I think it's a worthless organization, as you said. Um, do you ever perceive a future in which these these big college universities, you know, college football, these big programs, college basketball, these big programs, ever go without outside of the NCAA starting, you know, possibly their own college organization for college football and stuff like that? Because the NCAA is worthless at this point. I, absolutely, I do. I, I think that's unlike your, the, your predecessor. You just asked a very good question. Right. Um, I think that uh, – I think that, that definitely down the road, there will be a an association that will be run by the power conferences, and and they will fall under a separate umbrella. I'm not saying the NCAA will disappear, but I think the NCAA is its own worst enemy. And I think by continuing to do some of the things that they do and dragging their feet and coming up with a, a decision on matters of importance, they will do themselves in. And, and I think that but down the road, we'll we'll have we'll have another association that probably will serve the needs uh, and police the power five uh, power conferences uh, in football and basketball and in other sports. Probably, uh, I think that'll happen. It'll probably be a while because you've got TV contracts to consider and and things of that nature that uh, legally bind the NCAA to these schools and these schools to the NCAA. But I think it'll happen down the road. Yes.
Yeah. All right, good question. Trace, you want to jump in? No, I mean, Mar- Marty, at this point, um, I think that you are. You're How you doing, right. Trace? I'm doing great, Marty. I appreciate you, uh, you being good. here. And uh, here's the thing, because uh, you're the only one that has some sense in the room, it's, it feels like, uh, about this whole Reds thing. When I watched the, the, the baseball game last night, here not one again. part of me, not one part yeah. of me thought to myself, oh, man, uh, the, the Reds messed up. I can't believe it. Look out. Look at, look at the Diamondbacks. They're just like the Reds. I, at some point, I guess my question is, if there is one in here, is um, why do we have to continue to go down this path of people always trying to compare the Reds to X team when in reality, do you think that in Arizona today that they are, they're running a parade because they think that Tommy Fan and Seawald got them over the hump? Because that, was, that is what actually won them the series, Marty. Do you think that they think that in Arizona today? Uh, I don't think so. Um... I, I think there are other names that are, would be forthcoming. Uh, I, I think Seawall certainly made a major difference in that bullpen. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, but at the same time, um, I, I think people are celebrating the fact that this ball club, not given a chance by anybody, probably even the majority of Arizona fans who went on opening day to watch them play, thought they would ever end up playing whoever, in this case, the Texas Rangers in the World Series. Um, people in Cincinnati are making a bigger deal uh, about uh, the Reds not doing it than I think uh, the folks in Arizona are making because they did do it, uh, especially when they say, oh, Paul Seawall, yeah, absolutely, Tommy Pham. Tommy Pham, are you serious? Yeah, I mean, get real. Um, I think that's a good question. Uh, so you guys sitting on the sidelines there off camera are two out of three. Uh, two out of three. Unfortunately, Elliot. Uh, no, uh, Trace made a made a great yep, asked yep. a great question, and, and then there's uh, one more to go. There's one more to go. We can't forget our main man who controls all the dials, okay. make sure everything works. Well, almost everything works because it, it really wasn't working very well today. Uh, is Casey McAllister? Casey, please go ahead. Your turn, Marty. I'm going to go a different direction. I'm going to go a different okay. direction than these guys. I'm going to talk some college football. What happened to your Tar Heels? 27 oh, to 31. Yeah, yeah. What oh, happened? Hey, no, what happened? Not, I thought Drake May was oh, like a top, top five pick. In the, that's oh, not a sore CNN. subject what, what with happened? me. Oh, that's what not happened? a sore subject with me. Unlike most rabid fans of a school, I'm a hell of a lot more objective about my thinking relative to Carolina and football and basketball than most rabid college fans. Uh, I use the big blue nation. You know, they lose their minds and – and nobody is uh, as good as they are, and That's blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think that Carolina did what they did. I, listen, last year I went to the Georgia Tech game late in the year. Carolina prohibitive favorites. Georgia Tech beat them to death in Chapel Hill. And then they spiraled out of control. Um, it just seems under Mac Brown that every year, if they have a fine football team, they get to a point where they play a team that nobody gives any chance at all of them winning over Carolina, and they do. Uh, so the, losing to Virginia like they did last Saturday, it didn't surprise me a bit. And now I'm going to keep an eye out to see how they react to that defeat because they play Georgia Tech on Saturday night. Uh, they've got Duke. They've got NC State. Uh, they've got Campbell University. Campbell. So somebody on Twitter said, yeah, yeah. Somebody said on Twitter, uh, listed the teams that Carolina had to go the rest of the way. They said, you know, who, what will be their final record? Now, they're six and one now after losing to Virginia. And I tweet, tweeted, they will be nine and two. They will lose to Duke. They will lose to Clemson. And they'll win the other three games, NC State, Campbell, and Georgia Tech. And Carolina fans lost their mind. They can't lose to Duke. I said, the hell they can't. Yes, they can <laughs> Because Duke's got a good football team. They played well against good teams this year. Um, so, you know, I, I it, it, it's unfortunate. I think Drake May will still be a number one draft pick. I don't think there's any question whatsoever about that. Uh, he'll be right there among the first two quarterbacks taken, Caleb Williams, uh, who's not had a real good year either. Um, so we'll see how t- it, it works out. But again, I'm, I was not a bit surprised that some team that wasn't supposed to beat them ended up winning and winning handily the other night. 
Okay, uh, this is the last question. We have many in the chat, and, and I have to always come back because your first real friend in the chat on this show uh, goes back a number, uh, well over a year ago. We celebrated our one-year anniversary recently. But if you remember Everett, right? Remember Everett, Henry? Remember I do. Everett, Everett wants to yes. know, is Michael Jordan the Dumbledore of the NBA? <laughs> That might be the single dumbest question I've <laughs> I say I would pan him. I, 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 he when, is a great follower of this program. Yeah, I don't care. you got a lot of great followers that are intelligent people. Uh, or maybe not. Maybe not. Um, <laughs> the Dumbledore of the NBA. Well, I mean, is Can that I not a legitimate question? question? Is that not a legitimate question? I don't follow this. Can I ask you a, so I don't know who – I wouldn't minute. know Dumbledore from Tweedledum or Tweedledee <laughs> well, I will for that tell matter. you that Dumbledore was a part of the Harry Potter yes, story. Yes, but I'm saying, but whatever yeah. Dumbledore is or was, is that a legitimate question asking is Michael Jordan? I don't have any idea what the relationship that, that he has, Everett has, in comparing uh, – in talking about uh, uh, Michael Jordan – as it relates to Dumbledore. I don't know, and I really don't care to find out. <laughs> Where it is. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you, as always, being so gracious with your time and your uh, expertise and opinions. We appreciate it very, very much. Hope you have a good rest no, of your no day. No more than I do, pal. No more yeah, than I, I do. I hope you have your legs back underneath you. You know, they say for men of the sea yep. when they're out for weeks at a time, uh, and yeah. in the mighty Atlantic, that when you get back on ground, it takes a little while to kind of get everything back together. I hope you're there. It looks yeah. like you are. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay. All right. All right. Well, have all a good right, rest buddy. of your day. All right. We love you. All right. I love all you right. too. You we'll all take talk care. To you later. Okay. Thanks, you right. bet. Thanks, bye bye. Nothing better. It's the best guest we have every week. Is Marty a cruise guy? Oh, yeah. He's a big cruise guy. I mean, yo, you didn't see Trace. You were gone. You were under the weather last week. We had him. He looked like a weatherman from uh, the Weather Channel. He had the lid on. You know, the, 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 um, most people, when they're out on the sea, they'll have, like, one of those yellow, you know, slicker things on. Yeah, right. But he had right. that beautiful Peter Millar pullover. It looks great. It was it pigs, I think. And so, I mean, if you didn't look at him and think, now there is a man of the high sea, Ahab, right? If you didn't think that then I don't know what you're watching. Best dressed man in Nova Scotia. No doubt about it. <laughs> no question about it. You know, I want to get back to this game real quick last night because okay. you get this debate all the time in baseball, especially since the advent of analytics and the importance that people put on analytics. And there are certain managers, there are certain general managers, there are certain owners that they all bought in on analytics. And I'm not going to sit here and beat all those folks down. I've done that enough in my life, okay? And they're some of the nastiest, angriest people I've ever been around in my life. So I'm not going to go down that road. I'm not going to make you mad today. But here is, if you watch the game last night, in the fifth inning is where this game was won and lost, okay? And it's interesting when you start looking at managers' decisions and players they ask to be put in certain situations. Yes, the back of a bubblegum card will frequently dictate what the manager decides to do with a particular player at the plate in a particular situation. But look, if anybody tells you that money doesn't have something to do with it, you're just not paying attention. The last time the Diamondbacks went to the World Series in 2001, I was broadcasting their games. Bob Brindley was the manager of the team. Every game in that series, except for game two and game six, they were right down to the final pitch of the game. I saw Bob Brindley ask Matt Williams. And for those of you who don't remember Matt Williams, he was like a 10 or 11-time All-Star, former National League MVP, easily could make a case for him being in the Hall of Fame. He was one of the great sluggers, won eight or ten gold gloves. He was one of the great all-around third basemen in the history of baseball. Matt Williams was a better player than Scott Rowland. 
Just go look up the numbers. He was a better player. I saw Bob Brindley in a World Series game at Yankee Stadium ask Matt Williams to put down a sacrifice bunt. And Matt Williams did not bat an eye. And on the first pitch, he dropped that thing like down like he had been doing it his entire life. I don't know at that point if he had ever been asked to put down a sacrifice bunt. All right, so where am I going with all this? Last night in the fifth inning, the Diamondbacks get a runner at second base with nobody out. They're down a run. The number nine hitter is coming up, Perdomo. Now, he's a number nine hitter for a reason, okay? He's a number nine hitter for a reason. But the guy was an all-star this year. They're down two to one in the fifth, right? Tori Lovello says, son, put down the bunt. He puts down the bunt. Executes it perfect. Rather, they had a guy at first. Forgive me. Guy at first, nobody out. He bunts the runner to second base. So what happens after that? You got to have guys execute. That's a word we use on this program all the time, right? Base hit, Corbin Carroll ties the game. Next guy comes up, base hit. They take the lead three to two. In the bottom of the fifth inning. Now the Phillies have just watched a 2-1 lead disappear. They're down two to one. Kyle Schwarber from Middletown, Ohio, comes up and leads off the inning with a double. Now here comes Trey Turner. Okay? Now Trey Turner has knocked the cover off the ball this entire postseason. He's one of two $300 million men in the Phillies lineup. He also is riding the tide of an 0-for-20 streak at the time. He can't buy a hit to save his life. The first pitch of the at-bat, the Phillies ask him to bunt. He looked like a strange man in a strange land being asked that. And this is a number two hole hitter. Great player. But the manager on the first pitch asked him to bunt. I mean, it wasn't even close. He fouls it off damn near in the Phillies' first base side dugout. They did not ask him to bunt again. What does Turner do? Not only does he not bunt, he hits a one-hopper to the third baseman, who looks Schwarber back, throws to first, one out. Well, you know what happened the rest of the inning, right? Strikeout, strikeout, end of story, 3-2, Arizona never looks back. Now, there are going to be people that are throwing stuff at their computers watching this show saying, are you kidding me? You're going to ask Trey Turner to bunt? Certain situations demand you do things differently as a manager. This isn't the Trey Turner who was 7 for 12 in the division series or whatever he was. This isn't the guy who knocked the cover off the ball. The whole, this is a guy like Castellanos during the series. You felt bad for him. It was so painful. Watching them in this series. The last 17 Philadelphia Phillies that came to the plate last night, 17 batters did not have a single hit. Their last hit was a double by Schwarber, who is still standing at second base. After a leadoff double. Game was won or lost right there, Reed Mouse. Yeah. Right there. It was certainly won right there. You you know, Tom, we talk about last night, and you know one player we keep talking about on the Diamondbacks, and I've I've said some things. I don't like watching him play baseball because I think it's ugly when he plays baseball, but he's a damn good player. It's Corbin Carroll. Yes, he is. Corbin Carroll last night, Tom, had a game that we won't remember two years from now. We won't remember five years from now. We won't remember. It's not like a three-run home run game. Well, they like will in Arizona, Arizona, though. They remember. will in Arizona. Yeah. It's not like Albert Pujols hitting three three home runs in the World Series or Reggie Jackson hitting three That's home right. runs in the World Series. But Corbin Carroll had one of the best postseason games last night that I have ever seen. In a game in which the Diamondbacks won 4-2, to two, Corbin Carroll scored two runs, brought in two runs, three hits, two RBIs, did everything that is in his game. Stole bases, yep. put the ball in play, and drove in runs as a rookie, Tom. And I just want to put a stake in the flag and say that I hope that we remember this game from Corbin Carroll, and I hope that his career blossoms into something, and we remember it blossoming right before our eyes in the NLCS Game 7 because that's one of the greatest performances I've ever seen. I mean, he, he like I said in the monologue, he was the best player on the field last night. 
and he had only had three hits the entire series. And, and Arizona's run game was completely shut down. I mean, like the Reds, that was a huge part of this team's game. No doubt. The run game. Fastest team in baseball. And then all of a sudden, when you needed it the most, they were the aggressor. If you just look at the physical presence, the crowd, everything, you would think, without a doubt, that Philadelphia was Goliath. They were going to be the aggressor. They were going to pound you into the ground. And I mean from the first pitch of that game, Two nights ago, it was very evident that Arizona was going to be David against Goliath here. They were going to take it to him, and that's what they did. Well, they steal four bases two nights ago, three or four more last night. Correct. You know when I knew that the bank, the win had been completely taken out of the sails of Philadelphia? Reminder, they're down two runs. We've seen this Philadelphia team score I mean, more run. I mean, in the NLDS, they looked unstoppable. They can score runs. Yep. And who's the player that comes up? They're five hole. Bryson Stott. Yep. Every time he comes up, what's the entire entire crowd do? They sing his walk up song. Everything's gonna be a o a o. Yep. Okay. Bryson Stott walks up in the eighth inning. Not a peep. Not a single sound in that stadium that everyone told us is the best home field advantage in baseball, and they can't get up in the eighth inning down two runs. That's how good this Diamondbacks team can be. That's how fickle Philadelphia fans can be. And that shows you that you can take the wind out of anything and home field advantage isn't as great as they say it is because they took it right out of their – the wind right out of their sails. It appears I was wrong, Tom. (laughs) It's the first probably ever I've ever been wrong. That's the first time time since you've come on the program I can remember. That's correct. I thought it was going to be a sweep. And they almost had them. They almost had him in a sweep, but then they lost the whole series in seven, so it wasn't really close. But here's the good news. Phillies, they've got a lot of great players. They're going to be back next year. Well, Aaron Nola's a free agent. <laughs> Most of them are going to be back. Castellanos is getting better. Castellanos has gotten a lot better. I, he's gotten a lot better. He's, I'd pay him $21 million a year. That's how good Castellanos is. I'd pay him $104 million. That's how great that guy is. Listen. The Arizona Diamondbacks, it's all about when you're getting hot. Arizona, Arizona Diamondbacks got hot at the right time. That's, that's really what this is. When the MLB playoffs expanded to six teams, it was to, it was to do things like this, create chaos. I know people are going to be upset. I, I, I don't know if you see this on Twitter or X.com, Tom, but I'm seeing a lot of people saying that this series doesn't have the juice. It doesn't have the juice. Nobody cares about the Diamondbacks. Nobody cares about the Rangers. I hate that mentality. I hate it because it, 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 it gives – the, the MLB, no reason to have smaller market teams. If, if, if we're not going to care about the Rangers or the Diamondbacks, then let's just do Yankees, Red Sox every year World Series. Don't play a season for the rest of everybody. But that's not what it is. I love it. It gives it a March Madness type feel. I love upsets. I love upsets more than anything. So to see the Diamondbacks cruise to a World Series is awesome. The issue is, and the issue, I'm, gonna, I, I'm probably going to go on a rant about it on Box Lunch today, the Diamondbacks making it is now going to justify all these sickos points that you don't have to spend to get to the World Series. So if that's what we're going to do, that's okay. Uh, but I, I, I like to think that the Rangers did it, did it the right way. They spent a b- bunch of money, and they're there. They also developed homegrown talent, so a little mixture of both. you got to do both. That's the thing. you got to do both. Yep. Right. I, don't think right. you I don't think the Reds could have made a move at the deadline. I think Sam Mole was a perfect move. If they wanted to go get Michael Lorenzen, I don't think it would have worked. I don't think it would have worked. I don't think it would have helped the way that people think it would have helped. Saying that, I do think if Nick Kroll had a higher budget in the past offseason – I think we would have had a better team. I think that's. I think that. I don't think that's debatable, Tom. I think if, if the Reds thought they could win, and Trace alluded to it earlier, uh, if you want to get it inside the mind of Nick Crawl, they probably thought, you know what, this team's not going to be good. Trust the process. We'll move on to next year. We'll forfeit. I think the issue with that is you should never forfeit a season. You should always believe in it. So if you're going to do that, you have to give Nick Crawl a little bit of money to spend during the offseason. And I don't think he had a d- bunch of money to do that. It's not Nick Crawl's fault. Nick Crawl's done a great job. It's the uh, it's the <laughs> the Castellini family, who I'm not a fan of. But to each their own. To each their own. Good for the Arizona Diamondbacks. Tom, the last three NL pennant winners have come into the postseason with the worst record of the National League teams that have yep. competed. That's so, right. so when people were talking 
back in July when we first started discussing about the Reds, whether or not they should go after arms and stuff like that. And I don't have a, I don't have a stake in the battle, but I will say this. For those of them that said, this isn't a World Series team. This team can't compete for a World Series. That's all a bunch of horseshit at this point. because That's just not true. That's well, an absurd take. That's a horrible take. What are you talking about? The last three teams that made the postseason. Reed, that Reed, made the, that Reed we just did this before the show. The teams that won the World Series got hot late. They, they, they were great teams late. Period. Point blank. They were great teams towards the end of the season. You want to sit here and take away, and you can do this with a lot of teams, but if you want to take away two weeks from the, from the, the Diamondbacks where they lost literally like nine or ten or eleven straight games in a row, they were a good team, if not a great team, the rest of the year. Great team. So to sit here and say, last year, do you want to say the Phillies were just this marginal team going into the postseason? Oh, they just have, they're marginally bad. Like the Castellanos, Bryce Harper, all these guys, they're just average-ass teams going into the postseason. They just magically go to the World Series. No, I'm, I'm, we, we can all agree and understand that in order to get to the World Series, you have to have a great team. You have to have some good frontline starters. This Reds team didn't have a single frontline starter. They didn't have anybody that you could trust as far as you could throw them to get you through three innings. Not a single one. Hunter Green would have been our number one starter, and when the game season was on the line, he went up to Cleveland, who could give a damn about baseball at that point in the season, and he got shelled. So to sit here and act like the Reds could have been the Diamondbacks is the most atrocious thing I've seen on Twitter since I've started getting on that app. Here's the truth. Corbin Carroll, okay, is a great player. Matt McClain is a great player. When Matt McClain got hurt and Graham Ashcraft got hurt, the season was over for the Reds. Point blank, end of story. They could have gone out and gotten whoever they wanted at the deadline. But the truth of the matter is, is that this Reds team is not, it's not fair to compare them to the Diamondbacks because on paper, genuinely, I know Tom said this, it's not even remotely close to the same for me. They were not even remotely close to the same team. If the Reds, and I get what you're saying, oh, they were, they, they were right there at the end of the year. They played horrible baseball. Horrible no baseball. No doubt. The last three and a half, four weeks of the season, and they were pulling up guys almost from the Florence Freedom to try to pitch in baseball games. So to sit here and suggest to me that the Reds were the same as the Diamondbacks is the most laughable, atrocious, ridiculous take that anyone can make. And you know, and I'm not saying Reed's saying this. I didn't I'm make saying that point. you know nothing about baseball if you watched the last four and a half weeks of the season and you thought, wow, the Diamondbacks and the Reds, they are the <laughs> same team. We didn't have Matt, Car Matt McClain. We literally were, we had Ellie De La Cruz who was literally on life support at this point because he hadn't, he couldn't hit water if he fell out of a boat the last four weeks of the season. And then on top of that, no Graham Ashcraft, no Nick Lodolo. Hunter Green is, is basically the beast. Uh, it's, it goes really high and it goes really down really fast. You don't know what wow. you're getting. And then at, beast. The, at the end of the day, there was nobody that you could count on in regards to going out there and being somebody you could act. Do you think this Reds team for a half a second would have walked into Philadelphia and won game six and game seven like the, like the Diamondbacks did? Oh, God bless America if you believe that. The, the, I'm done. Well, so <laughs> also, I mean, to, to, to farther your chat. point, you to have farther, got the chat just to, completely. To, to farther blown your up. point, Tom, to farther your point, you said the two guys struck out <laughs> after the bunt. They did not, and to, 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 to make your point even better, if he would have got that bunt no, down. No, fly ball on the next one. If he'd have gotten the bunt exactly. down, Bryce fly Harper, ball to Bryce field. Harper yes. hit that really long game. fly ball. Yes. Yes. That would have tied the game. Yeah, to, I was at, thinking at later three to for three. the same guy's bunch of it back. You're but, right. But, but it would have tied the game That's if he right. got that runner over. I also don't think, and I, not to get off the sign tangent, do you think the Phillies asked Trey Turner to bunt, or do you think he was just losing some confidence? I knew, was knew, looking, knew that he could help the team and maybe he could bunt for a hit. Asked. But, but see, here's, was, the, here's, the, he here's the problem I have in general with the press, okay? And I, I've been a member of it forever. Now, knowing a town like Philadelphia, there's no doubt in my mind that somebody in that town in the press conference after with the skipper, Thompson, had to ask that question. Now, I haven't found the answer to it yet. I'm sure somebody did. But frequently, there are situations, and we get so caught up in, you know, the, 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 the storyline of, oh, the Phillies and the heartbreak and the devastation and everything they had going on and the fans and the crowd. And blah, blah, blah. Instead of what you're there to report on, and that being what happened during the course of the game. I would really like to know. That's a legitimate question. 
Trey Turner's a savvy guy. He's a hell of a player. He's a smart player. So he might have bunted on his own. Let's assume for a second he did bunt on his own. Okay? If he bunted on his own in the first pitch, now some would say, well, you're no way you're going to bunt again on the second pitch. You might end up in an 0-2 hole. Well, you know what? That's shame on Trey Turner if he can't put down a bunt when thrown a strike. If he can't put down a bunt to advance a runner to third base. Now, it's a little harder when Schwarber's running than somebody else. But if you're the Phillies manager right there, if Turner again is red hot, has two hits in the game, coming off a three-hit game the night before, had two hits in game five in Arizona, okay, you want to let him swing? Big-time player, all-star player, one of the best all-around players in the game? Okay, all right. But at that moment in time, he wasn't. He was 0 for 19 or 0 for 20. You had two guys in that Philadelphia lineup that were on 0 for 20-something plus stretches. You know, look, I get lumped in all the time, and I feel worse for him than I do for me. That whole meme that's gone around about me and Castellanos and calling that home run and all that kind of stuff. I've talked to Castellanos. I feel terrible for him that that happened. Because he shared with me that, you know, everywhere he goes, that follows him. And that should have nothing to do with him. I have no ill will whatsoever against Castellanos. When I reached out to him to try and talk about some of this stuff, he was as honest and open as you could possibly be about it. I had asked him about coming on the show. He originally said, yeah. And then he said, you know what? I'm just not ready to talk about it yet. And I say, you know what? God bless you. Good for you. That's fine. At no point in time because of that situation would I ever root against Castellanos because, in fact, I root for him to do well because I think he is truly a stand-up guy. He didn't duck the media last night. He was right there in the middle of Philadelphia clubhouse answering any question that anybody asked. He was 0 for 23 to finish the series. But you had two guys that were, that were almost take away the names on the back of their jerseys and put on a different name if you just went what they were doing in the series at the time. And you didn't know it was Turner or Castellanos. Whoever that player was up in that situation, you were going to ask him to bunt. And Thompson didn't do it. And the sack fly would have been by, by Harper uh, to left field the next time up. And then the big boys got their chance late. And this is what we talk about all the time. And look, it, I mean, it, it, Harper said it best at the end of the game. He said, that guy threw a pitch that I wish I could have back 100 times. He had an exit velocity of 107 miles an hour. I can't remember what the launch angle was, but generally the two combined mean a home run. But he said it probably missed the barrel by one-tenth of an inch, and that's the difference between us winning and losing. said he felt sick to his stomach that he hit that fly ball with the go-ahead run on base to left field that was the final out of that inning. Stand-up dude, Harper. Quickly, do you, do you think that – or did it come out that they asked him to bunt? Or we, or we, I'm or waiting we all to find out. To I'm waiting to find because out. Because I, I honestly believe that he did it on his own because I, I just don't – and I, I could be wrong. Him, I could I'm be sure wrong. Someone... It's, you're asking Trey Turner to bunt. It seems like uh, – it just seems – I'm not saying they shouldn't have asked him to do it, but usually you would leave it up. Like if, if you have a big-time player and Trey Turner's a big-time player, you would give them the opportunity to kind of decide what they want to do. I think in my mind, this is all speculative, obviously, he tried to make kind of like a bunt hit. And then the way that bunting has been shamed, and I, I don't mean it to be like, but that's just the word that comes to mind. Bunting has been shamed so much over the span of the last five, six, seven, eight years. Longer than that. Whatever it may be. But I think that he ultimately, after he failed the first time to bunt, he got cold feet and was like, I ah, just not, I'm not going to go down with my at bat trying to, trying to bunt. And ultimately, obviously, ended up grinding out. I, I would be shocked to believe that he was asked to bunt. And I think that, uh, you know, as a player on the Reds, who I think bunts a lot of the times when he feels like, and I'm not overmatched a strong word. I don't mean it that way. When he feels like there's somebody on the mound that is going to be a tough ask for him to get a hit of is TJ Friedel. He bunts, TJ Friedel bunts a significant amount of the time. 
when there's a lefty on lefty matchup and he does it because and usually in situations Tom where it'll get a runner over but he's also trying to get a hit out of it too so it serves a double purpose yeah. if he if he gets the bunt down great he gets the runner over and people are going to scream and yell why is he bunting with a guy on second base well he thinks he can get a hit and he already probably in his mind doesn't love the matchup yeah I, I hear you Trey. I hear you uh do we have our guests ready to go we do. Let's, let's visit with Charlie first, and then we will get to the weather today. Oh, yes. Great weather. It is? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Kind enough to join us, Cincinnati.com. I mean, whether it's Reds, whether it's Bengals, whether it's everything in between. Charlie Goldsmith, how are you, young man? How's everything going? You get a little downtime with no baseball and the Bengals having uh, a bye week? I did. Uh, I don't do the weather. I just wanted to put that out there. Not my uh, expertise. Well, you know what? We'll cut you some slack on that because <laughs> your areas of expertise are broad. I want to start with this. Much has been written. You've written about it. Much has been made. Before we get into some of the, 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 the matchups for this weekend against San Francisco, um, do you think the Bengals are going to step out of the box a little bit and make a deal at the trade deadline? I don't. Um, this is a Bengals team that has made every decision to get to this point with a specific philosophy in mind, building from within, building through the draft and building around players with you know specific archetypes and specific strengths. The sense I get is kind of like the Reds did. They're sticking to the plan, even though right now it's more obvious to make a move by far more obvious than it was in 2021 and 2022, just because of how clear their needs are. Personally, like I would trade for Samaj P. Ryan. I think that would just change everything about what the Bengals' offense on third down can be. But the sense I get is that's not who they are. Um, they don't want to push more chips into this season um, in a very competitive AFC, uh, even though it could put them over the top. They view it as what's the best chance to win a Super Bowl looking at a bigger picture. Again, probably not everyone will agree with that. That's not how you know every team does it. Look at the Eagles, but the Bengals are sticking with their philosophy. Um, you know, I, I, I just feel like I understand everything you said and I agree with everything you said, but, but it's kind of like, uh, you know, almost likening this to the playoff game in baseball last night. There are certain situations that call for certain moves and there, it, it just strikes me that if there was ever a year, because whether or not you believe the when the, you know, this window and you hear about it all the time and, you know, as long as Joe Burrow's here, they've got a window to win a title. Well, you know, that all may be true, but it just this year, it just seems to me it hasn't felt right. A lot of that has to do with Burrow and the calf and all that kind of thing. But even healthier against Seattle, two great drives, and then the wheels fell off the offense. If they were to make a move, let's say they surprised you and me, and they were to make a move, where would make the most sense to make that move? What, what part of the team? So I keep going back to Piran because it is a very complex offense. And I get the sense that, you know, as smart as these NFL players are, if you drop a new tight end or even a new third down back without much familiarity in the scheme, that's the type of challenge that the Bengals have avoided with different decisions they've made over the years. Like, I know it's extremely different, but last year when Jamar Chase got hurt, they put Trent Nerwin in because he knew exactly what to do and always was in the right position and, and had already built up a lot of trust in Burrow. I think it probably would be a big challenge to build up that trust with, say, a new tight end on the fly in the season or during the season which is why I keep going back to P. Ryan, one of the most trusted players on last year's team, someone you know exactly how he fits and exactly what areas of the team he can make an impact with. If it were anywhere else, I could say, you know, they could use some more depth on the interior of the defensive line. That's been a weakness of the team overall this year. But, you know, backup defensive tackles aren't necessarily uh, things teams are dying to trade or, or going to make much of a difference on the trade market anyway. So I do keep going back to running back and to P. Ryan in particular. Okay. All right. Well, all right. Let's move on now. Uh, getting ready for this week. Uh, much has been made. Again, you're, you're down there. You're, you're talking to these guys, players, locker room, coaches, all that kind of thing. Uh, you got a lot of guys on the inside. There's been a lot of speculation of what the Bengals might or might do in terms of changing things uh, philosophically uh, from an offensive standpoint. Do you envision some subtle or not so subtle changes in the offense schematically? 
I think you're going to see it. I think you're, they've said you're going to see more under center runs, which is the opposite of the scheme change the Bengals made at this point last year. I think specifically you're going to, to see that to try to set up more play action opportunities down the field. That's something T. Higgins has thrived with. I think you're going to see more Chase Brown. Joe Mixon has been asked to take too many snaps and carry the ball or touch the ball too often. When you look at what his role is, they're even asking him to do more than he did over the course of last season, and he hasn't been great, and those two things are probably connected. And then the last one is tight end. Is now the time you make the switch to Tanner Hudson? He is a better receiver than Irv Smith. Irv's a better blocker, but the role that he is in is in a receiving-focused role anyway. Um, that's an answer I don't have yet, but I definitely wouldn't be surprised if, you know, on Saturday they elevate Hudson from the practice squad, and then you're seeing him play more snaps than anyone else at that position. The Bengals need a spark. They're making real changes to try to see what sticks and see what can provide it. All right, on the defensive side, uh, it's safe to say they started poorly. They've come on strong here the last uh, three games. Uh, especially when Seattle had the ball inside the red zone a couple of times, including the very end of the game, uh, to keep them out of uh, the end zone and coming up with big sacks and all that kind of thing. Do, do you think that that's a case where, you know, I, and, and I used the example last week, Charlie, about, you know, uh, frequently recalling things that people said. And I remember, it might have been, you got the quote, Rana Rumo said, you know, my worst nightmare is uh, the two safeties walking out the door. Well, we know that's exactly what happened. They walked out the door. I just wonder if maybe some of the things that were hiccups on defense early was a situation where it just took him a while to understand what he has back there or what he doesn't have or what he has somewhere else and doesn't have somewhere else, and now they're starting to get it figured out. Not to put the onus on the players because part of coaching is getting the most out of the players you have, uh, but it was a slow, rocky, up-and-down start for Dax Hill, uh, for Nick Scott, and I'll loop in Cam Taylor-Britt with this as well. I know we're focused on the safeties, but two crucial plays early in the season were a deep ball they allowed against Zay Flowers in Week 2 and uh, two deep balls that DeAndre Hopkins caught against Cam Taylor-Britt in Week 4. The safeties, there were moments that I could point to uh, specific plays where they were a step slow or they weren't quite in the right zone covering the middle of the field. That was a big deal against the Ravens uh, or where there was just a little split second too slow communication on the back end passing off an assignment an assignment again you saw that against the Ravens you saw missed tackles on the back end against the Titans I think you're you're starting to see some of that get figured out Dax Hill is they're really high on Dax Hill uh, they see Dax Hill maybe becoming the best player on the Bengals defense but it's his first year as a starter they're seeing more consistency but still not quite the consistency they had last year so kind of the story of the second half will be this uh, evolution and development continuing it has gotten better but there is still definitely room to grow it definitely does need to grow by the time they face you know Kansas City in the postseason Casey you are the biggest Bengals fan in the room is there anything you would like to ask Mr. Goldsmith and his expertise um, not at, not at the current moment. No. You have got to be shitting me. <laughs> I turn to you and I ask you, and, and that's what I get. Oh, well, I was I was doing other stuff for the show. <laughs> I didn't have anything prepped. Go ahead, Reed. Good lord, this just started <laughs> and, and just continued. Where I used to be somebody. It's been a tough day, Charlie. It's been a tough day. Right, um, so, go Charlie, ahead, one thing that, you know, when we talk about the Bengals and a lot of people have made to do about their play calling and all that stuff, all that, one thing the Bengals mm -hmm. haven't done this year because they couldn't, because Joe was hurt, was go under center mm -hmm. a whole lot. They didn't want him turning his back to the defense. They didn't want him, you know, dropping back that far because he was limited mobility-wise. But that has hurt the run game. That has certainly hurt the play action and, and play call. Do you think that the Bengals going forward will do anything, you know, make a conscious effort to play under center more? Yes. Um, I think you were going to see some of this at the start of the season if Burrow hadn't gotten hurt. The Bengals were studying run games like the Dolphins and the Eagles especially, looking at what they were able to do to just create mismatches in the run game and take advantage of the athleticism they had overall on the team to set up consistent runs. I think they were planning specific changes that had more under center elements. They just didn't get a chance to get to them because Burrow – physically couldn't line up under center for the first four weeks of the mm -hmm. season. Bengals are in the stage now where, you know, if Burrow's not 100%, he's essentially 100%. They're going forward as he is 100%. Uh, so for those reasons, I do think you're definitely going to see more under center runs. It'll, you know, it opens up different angles. There are different 
you know, things you can do, different pulling guards, different, you know, schematic wrinkles. You're less predictable. There, again, there's less you can do when you're in shotgun. I do think you'll see more of that under center package going forward. Zebra, anything for uh, Charlie? Yeah, Charlie, I, I've, got a, I've got a question, Charlie. Um, T. Higgins right now has played very, very bad, very, very bad. Do you think as the season progresses, T. Higgins is going to come back as, him for, as his former self at some point because he's a shell right now? So, like, the question, right, is how do you fix the Bengals' offense? And number one, line number one for me is T. Higgins. Um, the Bengals, I uh, just talked about some scheme ideas they had. The other side of that page that they were changing was they were expanding Higgins' role. They were using him more in the slot. They were, like, doubling the amount of, uh, of routes he ran in the offense. They were looking for specific ways to get him the ball more and feature him more as a way to open up the whole offense. That shows how important T is. And when T's not making those plays, that shows how important it is what they're missing. Like the one play I go back to was the third down. Bengals are trying to run out the clock, but they see a matchup they like in the last two minutes against this, against the Seahawks, and they throw a deep all over the top. Higgins commits OPI, and he can't get it done. Like that's T. That's the play he needs to make. Also, like physical catches over the middle, not quite as sharp. The ribs injury is real. Like the biggest reason I think he hasn't yeah. been that guy is because of the ribs, just like Joe wasn't himself because of the calf. Like the ribs injury is more real than we realized or than, you know, what we were talking about at the time. So he's got a heel and that should make him better. The Bengals really need him to get to that level. All right. Trace, last thing. Anything for Charlie? No, I, I, I'll, I'll make it a little more. I'll make it a little more fun for Charlie. Uh, Charlie, two two questions that are that are one's not fair at all. First question that's not fair is if you were in a uh, in a trust tree and someone had to ask you which sport you you enjoy covering more. I don't know if you can. Ple- You're allowed to plead the fifth, by the way. I don't want to get you in trouble here. Do you like covering football or baseball more? So it's different, and I get to do different things. Um, football is so much more focused on a scheme, so much more focused on tiny details within an offense that change over time. Baseball is so much more individual, like how's Hunter Green's changeup? You know, what's Ellie De La Cruz doing with his batting stance? Stuff like that. So the way you cover it's very different, lends to very different types of stories. I'm not going to answer the question because I really do truly enjoy covering <laughs> Nice. Good, good politics. Go. Good politics, man. Go. Second question, because this is such a uh, serious sports talk show. Yes, it very is. Serious. Uh, very serious. Is that if you uh, had to watch one movie every day for, for two straight weeks, what movie do you choose? It's <laughs> a great question. Um, I'd, I'd want to go with a comedy. Um, what's the comedy I really like? I'm Talladega Nights? I'll, I'll, use this, <laughs> I'll use this moment to make a different take. My favorite sports movie, movie of all time is Like Mike. I know that is very controversial mm-hmm. and very out of the blue. I think oh, it's wow. a – I think it's – I could talk about Like Mike for 20 minutes, my favorite sports movie of all time. Charlie, I actually, I'm, I'm going to take it real quick. Or, or No, I'm not. No, you got no, it. No. What? You take it. Oh, you take it, who's Elliot. Got, who's got it? Okay. All right. So I, so I was going to ask. Uh, Reed has ruined the movie Moneyball for me. He says all of it's inaccurate. Um, I, I don't like that he's he's done that to me because that's my my personal uh, favorite baseball movie, sports movie of all time. I'm in that movie, you know. Tom is in that movie. All over that Tom movie. Tom is in See, that like movie. like I said, I used to be somebody. Please continue, <laughs> Elliot. That's all I had. I just wanted to throw in that Reed ruined that movie for me. Uh, but I do like Like Mike. Like Mike is a very good film. Tom, my Got favorite it. scene of Moneyball is where he's walking around the, the stands and listening to you. I think that's, that's right. the best part of the movie. I mean, Billy Bean and I have had so many conversations through the years about, you know, he would – and they portrayed it in the movie, but I was just always blown away because I always liked him as a guy a lot. I don't know if you ever had a chance to be around him or talk to him, but I, I mean, I really like him. Uh, but, you know, he, he, during the games, he would never watch the games from the stands. He'd go down in the athletics clubhouse and run on the treadmill during the entire game. And he never physically would be outside watching the game. Uh, and, and so he like, he like knew every announcer in baseball who announced for everybody where most general managers, they wouldn't even know your name. Casey, before we let Charlie go, yeah. have you come up with something that's dawned upon you being the <laughs> Bengals fan that you are? <laughs> yeah, I do actually. Um, you do a football the, show on this, pro, on this channel. I, you know? I do. I just, you know, I just wasn't ready to be the first one to, to, to ask the question. That's, that's all. It is. But ahead. I do have one question for you. There is some speculation that I mean, it's probably more fan speculation than anything, but Tanner Hudson possibly making the roster starting over Irv Smith senior or junior. 
is that is that have any legitimacy to it? There was some quotes that were kind of taken out of context from coaches that maybe that there's an answer there. I think there might be an answer there. Um, like I was saying earlier, Tanner Smith is uh, Tanner Hudson is a better receiver than Irv Smith. And they've been featuring Irv and just receiving only opportunities. And if you're having Irv out there to be a receiver, I think the offense might work and look better with Hudson out there. It did work and look better when Hudson was out there for those two games. He has better production in those two games than Irv has had all season. When you're looking at changes that could be made from a personnel perspective, I think more Tanner, more Chase Brown, and then maybe some more four wide receiver sets with Irwin in there. I think those could be interesting places to start for the Bengals to find a spark. All righty. Great stuff. Great stuff. Uh, Charlie, thank you so much for your patience, uh, your understanding, uh, even your forgiveness in many, many ways. If somebody were to go back and watch this show in the annals of time, they will know that um, that you could have asked the question multiple times. Is there an echo in here? Is there? I haven't heard an echo. Is there an echo? Okay. well, you're, you're being very, very kind. So, Charlie, have a great rest of your day. Thanks for your time today, man. Always appreciate it, and keep up the great work. Thanks, guys. All right, Charlie Goldsmith. Man on his game. On his game right there. Love having that guy on. Tells you everything you want to know. That's right. He's dialed in. Sometimes multiple times. All right. um, Casey, are you okay? (laughs) Yeah, I'm fine. Seriously, are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm a little worried about you today. What? I just, I mean... I, I'm going to not the, – the boss is here, so I'm going to keep everything on the down low. Okay. The sun is shining in Hamilton, Ohio. When is it not? It always is, Tom. Elliot, please take it away. It always is shining here in Hamilton, Ohio, the best part of Ohio. I've, I've been all around the, the state. This is by far the best city in the state, by far. There is no city close to it. This is a magical place. It's a lot like Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. Everything's edible, and you can do whatever you want here. It's just, it's just, and they got Oompa Loompas. So, now today, the weather, not really going to change much. Not really going to change at all. So, very good outside. There's going to be some clouds. There's going to be some sun, blah, 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 blah. That's all it is. High of 75, low of 40, 48, I believe, I saw. High of 75, low of 48. That's what the weather is. Again, that's all I have, because that's all the weather is. You ask one thing, unless there's a tornado blowing a by, there is none. So that's all I've got. That is all I've got. I'm not going to throw it to Ronald Reagan. I won't do it. Reed doesn't like the bit, so I'm not going to do it. But all I can say to you, if you go outside, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Also, I want to say one thing about the echo in the room. Casey was put on the spot. This is my guy over here. This was not his fault. He did not know. He was doing a lot of things with this computer over here that I don't know how to do. So Casey, Casey gets a pass for that. Well, like it didn't help that every single time that Someone asked a question. It was going to be something that I was going to ask about, but that's neither here nor here. That's neither, that's neither here nor here. So he said it first. He <laughs> so, <laughs> said neither so. there or here or without, there. Without further ado, let's throw it to Reed. Yeah, let's bring it over here. So this just buys just enough time for Casey to, to turn that camera around because we got to do some ad reads. We just talked about the Bengals, so that means we're going to do the Bengals report. Presented by who, Casey? Encore Technologies. Encore Technologies provides IT solutions for a data centered world. With a suite of services from mobile computing to desktop to data center, supporting both centralized and work from home computing modules to improve efficiency and productivity. Something I do not have at the current moment. And then we have Pawnee Water, made right here in Hamilton, Ohio. Pawnee Water uses natural limestone filtration, unlike the artificial processing that other brands use. The result is a healthy alkaline water. and quite frankly, the best tasting water in the world. You can visit Pawnee Water at P-A-H-H-N-I water.com see where you can buy this great tasting water. And for me, it's the pH level. It's a solid eight. It's not a seven, it's not a nine, it's an eight. Reed, what do you like about this water? I like natural limestone filtration. It's the best way to filtrate your water. That's why it's the best tasting water in the world. It's made right across the street. One thing's in the bottle, water. And uh, when I drink it, I go, ah. So, I mean, ah, there. There we go. <laughs> Tom, we did the ads. We're all good? We're good. Okay. Well, uh, what would you guys like to talk about? Anything well, that we need to tie a ribbon around? Uh, well, well I, no, I'd like to ask something. What were the echoes in the room, Tom? What were the echoes uh, in the room? Are you serious? What were they? I mean, okay. 
Let's talk about the echoes. In the first two and a half minutes of the interview with Charlie, I said, okay. I asked him about the trade deadline. Right? He answered the question. I said, if they were to make a trade at the deadline, what would be the position where you might see that? He went into that. Then I said to him, you know, much has been made about changes in the offense. Do you suspect there will be any changes in the offense, schematically, whatever it might be? He says, the first two things he says is, one, they're going to go up under center more. Yep. Joe Burrow up under center. He's healthier now. We're going to see more play action, uh, and we're going to see more of him under center. The second thing I think we're going to see is I think we're going to see Tanner Hudson at tight end and not Irv Smith. They're going to bring up Tanner Hudson from the practice squad. He's a better receiver. This, this was his quote, which he said twice. He said he's a better receiver than Irv Smith, not as good a blocker, but they need an offensive weapon at the tight end position. Well, I just missed that. Well, Tom, I'll, so I'll admit that I don't know. I'll admit that who I need to that. further illustrate. Okay, no, no, wait, wait. No, no. So what you're saying was my Trace. question was, I want to clear it. I want to get out in the open. My question was good. The T. Higgins thing, that was a good bit. That was a good question. Which one? Oh, my T. Higgins question. I asked him about T. Higgins. You to pat him on the back for asking a question. That was a solid question. Thank you, Tom. That's what we were getting to. Yeah, baby. That's, Listen, a, that's Tom, redemption for the Marty. That's, the, that's redemption I'll for admit, the Marty I'll admit I did one. not hear him talk about, about Irv Smith and Tanner Hudson. And that, Trace, that just, you don't that, even that, need did, to admit that. But I... <laughs> <laughs> Trace, Trace but, you know, don't need to tell honest, everybody something honesty, we know. Though, but in all honesty, though, it didn't seem – it felt more fan speculative than it was actually legitimate. It just became legitimate, like, not that long ago. So, it's, I, I don't know. I, and I want to explain, I wanna, I wanna explain well, something real quick. Listen. I want to explain something real quick. So, what happens is we're doing interviews, and i gotta, I got to interact with the chat. Part of my job is to interact with these great people that watch our show. I love them very much. Trace act, a, asked a cowardly question. If I wanted to do that, I could do that every time. Hey, Charlie, what's your favorite color? So, I could, I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to start stealing his bit. I'm going to start asking him about nonsense because I took a risk and asked, asked about T. Higgins. That's what I did. I took, that was a gamble. That was a good journalistic move by me. I'll tell you who is really coming to bat in the chat today like I have never seen before for any one particular person, and that is Blackmore for Reed Mouse. Yeah, it's good to have somebody in my corner, Tom, but they, I, Blackmore, you're, we're in a losing fight here. He oh, says you are the goat of this show. Right, which is just, uh, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate that, but we all know that's just not true. We all know that's not true. I mean, I think it is true. Casey, Casey has an excuse for asking the question that, that Charlie already asked. I don't. I just simply wasn't paying attention. <laughs> they, they called on me, and I just looked around. I would like to think. I would like to think that I was uh, doing some rhetoric and just letting Charlie nail home a point because, I mean, if you ever took a rhetoric <laughs> you class. Know you know what? I think you're right. Right. You That's wanna, a you good wanna point. Keep, you want to keep hammering a point. I just wanted him to reiterate because I think it was a great point. That's all I was doing, Tom. That's took fair. Some That's classes. fair. I get that. I understand that logic. I do. Big time Bluffton education right there. Yeah. Yeah. Sh- shout to out. Me, to I don't, I don't fair. do what Reed does. I don't bad mouth his alma mater. He the only thing Reed did do today, all the, time. the only thing, all the, time. the only thing Reed did do today that was preposterous, if we're being honest, was 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 legitimately <laughs> ten seconds before the show starts, drops a "Hey Tom, yeah. did you yeah. hear these guys are bad mouthing yeah. you?" Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. what kind of what and, kind of and, shit is that, Tom? And in an Listen. act of you know fellowship, <laughs> right? When I could have lit his ass up, he could have in mid sentence, right? What did I do? I sat back and I was quiet. Now, I did roll my eyes at him as he was asking the question. Right? But I mean, was a right statement. before we went on the air, Reed says to me, hey, man, <laughs> did you hear those guys on local radio bashing you the other day? <laughs> Listen, Tom. I mean, do you think that's like something new for me? <laughs> but look. I'd like to think I deal with that when I walk out of this studio. You know, I can deal with that stuff on my drive home or, you know, if I'm, if I'm somewhere and somebody wants to bring up something or all the memes on, you know, social media. All this, but I, I, I thought when I came in here yeah. That's where this is going. that I wouldn't hear that as much. This is a safe space. And I mean 10 seconds before the red light comes on. Hey, man. <laughs> Cheer those guys bad mouthing you on local radio. <laughs> hey, I once again don't don't have an excuse. It's not good. Listen, I you you're you're 
You are who you were raised by. You are who you were hang around your entire life. And listen, yeah. growing up, that makes sense. I would go. I would go on the field, play baseball. Head coach happened to be my dad. Would just be like, hey, "You're kind of a piece of shit." All right, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> so he didn't I understand. Do that. But I listen. I'm sorry. I was. I was. I was trying. I was trying to lift you. I was trying to fire you up, Tom, so you could have your best. Kurt Schilling before 2001 World Series. Everyone doubts you, Kurt. That's go it. out there. That's go it. A, go win a World Series MVP. I was trying to. I was trying to inspire you, Tom. I'm sorry I failed. Positive vibes. Everybody's good. Trace is good. Casey's good. Reed's good. Not good. I'm good. The I'm one really good. guy I'm most concerned about because we've not seen him lately. Yeah. You know where I'm going. I don't know yet. Yes, you do. No, I don't. We've not seen him around town. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. No. All right, we got uh, some super we chats. We got, we got, got we some Casey super chats. We have Casy Stink do we get to, Did we get to these super chats before I make a full No, we have not. All right, really quickly, uh, Mr. Moe says, this is the new NCAA president's first big scandal. We don't know how he's going to handle this or work this. He could try and make an example of them, but I doubt it. Uh, that's a good point by Mr. Moe. Shy town with the best comments says, Trace is the show's MVP. And then Derby Stardom, Tom, has joined the leader of yes, men. Yes, indeed. He's going to enjoy box lunch is what he's going to do. And that's coming up today right after the show. Right after the so show. Told, right? right after the show. Okay. All right, we'll stick around for that. That'll be great. I can't wait to tell Elliot right before he hosts it about what people were saying about him. <laughs> I already know it. I see it all the time on, on X.com, Tom. People are real mean to the old Elliot, but that's okay. That's okay. You get back up. You get back off the mat, and you fight. You fight like hell, Tom, and that's you what do. I'm doing. You got to keep fighting. That's right, Just baby. keep getting up. They knock that's you down. Just keep getting up. That's right. Right? Don't that's let it. them beat you down. Hashtag free Harbaugh. <laughs> All right. Do we have? Do we have? Um, we have two segments left, Tom. We have Casey right, Stinklist. What do we have? Casey Stinklist. This thing's it, it started falling apart, and now it's down to threads. What? Where, where are we next? Stinklist. 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 Tom. Stinklist. Casey. <laughs> I know you're prepared for this. So prepared. Okay, and Charlie hasn't commented on anything yet about the stink list, so we're not going to repeat ourselves. Take it away. <laughs> well, again, like last week, I have decided that I'm going to reveal the stink list to our viewers because that's just a nice little added touch, something that uh, I hadn't done before. Love and, this black screen. Yeah, it's just a black <laughs> screen. And we're going to start with – This is good. The Browns being at the very bottom at Putrid still. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, nice. they just suck. They look so oh bad. My God. They're, they're the worst oh team. Oh, my God. The they're four and two. <laughs> I mean, they, they were giving the game. They, have lost. they should be two and four they're right now. They're winning games the with NFL a admitted backup. That they should have lost that game. They're ba- winning games with a star formerly from the XFL at quarterback. And they're four and two. That's supposed to be impressive. Go ahead. Um. Then we go to nauseating. These teams uh, have no futures at the current moment. Um, not at least at this point okay. in time in this Fair season. Enough. I think all these teams arguably are uh, the bottom of the, uh, of the tiers in all the NFL. And then we go to the stench. These teams, they're just barely above nauseating. They, they have something, some very glaring weaknesses, though, that just stench, right? Kirk Cousins kind of proved me wrong, though. He almost made it out. He looked great, great the other night. What, what have you done about? for me lately, Casey? Yeah. 378 yards. Yeah, but the rest of these teams, they got something significantly wrong with them that I just can't get by. What's wrong with the men of the uh, the men of aluminum? <laughs> They're four and two. Four future. and two undefeated four in the division. Best division two. in sports. <laughs> I, I mean, they've beaten the Ravens. What about the Buccaneers? The Brownies. I, I just, Buccaneers are the Steelers, they have one of the worst offenses I've ever seen operate. You watch I, the I can't. I don't. I don't trust <laughs> Kyle Pitts one one bit. That's why they're in the stench. We move on to the teams that stink in the NFL. All these teams <laughs> yeah. that you see here, the list. they uh, they they just have a little stink to them. You know, they they'll probably have some a push. Little aroma. They'll they'll have yeah a little aroma. They'll okay. they'll probably make a push for a playoff spot. Some of them will make it. Some of them won't make it. But yeah, these teams right here, I, I, there's just. They, they are a couple pieces away from being legitimate. And we go to the odorless category. Okay. These are teams that are probably shoe-ins for the playoffs. All right. Um, can, I, can I just ask shoe-ins. you one yeah. objective question? Yeah, what's your objective sure. question? How in the world, mm-hmm. if you were to take this, this right here and just flip it completely upside down, is where you would basically find the standings in the – AFC North. Almost. Okay? Yeah. How are the Bengals 
put higher into a category than three teams they trail in their own division. Could you just please well, explain yeah, the logic yeah, I can behind that? I can explain that, Tom. Well, okay. like the past three weeks, they've beaten the number one team on my stink list. That just bumps them up a few tiers. I, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, okay, that's the only reason why right. they're up there. I mean, they, they got another tough one coming up. The Eagles, they're fresh. I just, I don't know. I they, they're definitely above the odorless, but they're not Super Bowl contenders in my mind. Mm. The Super Bowl contenders are San Francisco and the Chiefs. Wow. Okay. If the Bengals beat San Francisco, man, they're, they're looking real they good. They might move into the fresh category. They might. They might, they might just move into the fresh category. Any comments about this, fellas, uh, as you look over this list? Yeah, the, the Pittsburgh Steelers being uh, a worse team than the New York Jets with Zach Wilson and uh, the Houston Texans who are playing better ball, but saying that the Steelers are worse than those two teams is, is a bit outlandish. But I get it's all part of the thing. Saying the Eagles aren't a Super Bowl contender is just crazy at this point. There's, there's several Super Bowl contenders, and the Eagles are easily on that list. But – I digress. San Francisco 49ers will be 5-3 and three after Sunday, so won't have to hear about how great they are anymore. Zebra. How about that prediction? Um, I think it's a great list. I think it has a lot of integrity up there, and especially the Browns being dead last in the NFL. I think that that's holds true. true. Yeah, that's true. No doubt about that. They're going to get, get another quarterback, Tom. Going out for Jacoby Brissett. Jacoby Brissett. There, there are rumors about that in Cleveland, that it would be the logical choice to bring him back. He's won I'm, a lot of I big games. I, I, I'm with you. I think that uh, – well, I mean, I don't know about that. But <laughs> he's I, – I thought the guy was solid. He was okay. Yeah. Better he was than okay Sean. with the Colts. Yeah. He was okay with the Colts. But I wouldn't – yeah. So, is, is that a – is that them saying that Deshaun's hurt or is that them giving up, you know, showing some cracks and some confidence in Deshaun Watson? Well, it's a good you question. and I were talking about this before the um, – um, Before the show. Before the show. We did a lot of talks before the show. We did. Uh, right up to the very second we came on the Correct. air. Correct. That's what I was but, to. Um, but the, the whole Watson thing, and, and you pointed out that medically been cleared we're twice. told he's been cleared twice. And he did not come back in the game after leaving. I think it was the first drive of the game, if I'm not mistaken. Second last drive. Week. Second yeah. drive? Okay. Second drive. Yep. He left um, and did not come back. People thought that he was going to play this weekend. It's starting to look more and more like he is not going to play this weekend. Um, and, and you're wondering, probably like a lot of Browns fans are wondering, what is going on up there? Yeah, Tom, I don't <laughs> – when a guy I, – I made this point. You give a guy guaranteed money. And you think that I'm off my rocker for suggesting this. But when you get guaranteed money, you don't got to play as much. You're still getting paid whether you're on the sideline or on the field. They have won two games. They beat the 49ers with the backup quarterback. Deshaun Watson looks abysmal for, for two drives. Backup comes in, they win the game. There's serious questions up there in Cleveland whether or not this team is better without Deshaun Watson. I know it. I know there's serious questions because Deshaun Watson has looked terrible since he has come back last year. He's looked very, very bad. Yeah. The games in which Jacoby Brissett played – I mean, he was significantly better than Deshaun. I mean, he had a better completion percentage, more yards in those games, more a better average, better touchdown to interception ratio. And yeah, he was sacked a little bit more, but he played significantly more games than Deshaun did. So I don't know. I well, think the Browns made a mistake by getting rid of Jacoby in the Well, first and place. they're admitting they made a mistake if they bring him back. Yep. So but but now all of a sudden they're four and two and people are thinking playoffs with the Brownies. And maybe they know something that we do uh, don't know about Deshaun Watson because why would you you know why would you be going out there and making a deal for a backup quarterback Correct. if you thought your guy was going to be back within another week? You've already gotten through two weeks without him. If the Cleveland Browns don't make the postseason this year, Tom, I don't know I don't know how you could ever take them serious again because they're, they're they have the weakest schedule in the division by a large margin. By a large yep. margin. They're 4-2. and two. They escaped by, got a win against the 49ers that they probably chalked up as an L. So they're 4-2 and two with already escaping with a win. If they can't make the postseason with their schedule going forward, then I don't know how you could take them serious going like in, in the years to come. Because it's, it's the easiest path by far in this division. By far. 
All right, we have a uh, buy or sell today, do yes, we not? We yes, we do. All right, yes, well, here we, we go. Let's let it rip. A little buy or sell today. Let's see what we think. You always come up with great questions here, Reed Mouse. We're yeah. leaning on you yet again. Thanks, Tom. You're Thanks, welcome. Thanks, Tom. Just uh, don't ask the same question twice. I might have to. Okay. I might have to. Uh, Casey, we got the, the intro, or do you just want me to let it rip? Just let it rip. All right, let it rip. <laughs> buy or sell. This is one that I put in there, and I think I have a, I have a good take on. I, we'll see how it comes. Tom, buy or sell. The Dolphins are not AFC contenders. Oh, I sell that all day, every day. Of course you they're, they're AFC serious? contenders. I didn't say serious. I th- you said contenders. Correct. I think on any given week, they're like just about every team in a league, except for maybe Kansas City. On every given week, they can beat anybody. Uh, the two best teams they've played, you could argue, they got drilled. Got drilled. Right? I mean, you just got drilled. Um, but both of those games, in fairness, were on the road. If they were to get, you know, you get down the stretch here, I think they've got a lot of good weapons. I think they've got a great offense, and I think they're going to score enough to win a lot of games that they would otherwise lose without that kind of offense. I am uh, selling. Sell, sell, sell. Sell, sell, sell. Trace, idea. Trace, let's go to you. Let's go to you over here. I feel like you're going to have a good – what I, I take on this? Do you I'm think gonna, that- I'm not, I'm gonna sell that. I think that the Dolphins are just as capable as most teams to, to, to make a run in the in the playoffs. Uh, I do, I do find it to where it does feel like maybe because because of where they play and the style of offense they play, as goofy as this sounds, they get linked to almost like USC in a way. Like they're just a warm <laughs> weather fair. team. Fair. They throw the ball all over the place. They're kind of glitz and glamour. But they're soft. Tom always mentions the colors of their uniforms right. and them going into a cold weather city That's and right. having to beat somebody. But they almost did it with a backup quarterback last year in Buffalo. They did. Um, I think that they're a good football team. So, um, I, and, and the other thing too is like, I think that there is and I, every year there's a lot of parity. Yes, in the NFL, but in the AFC, I'm not. And I know it's going to sound like I'm doing a bit, and I'm not doing a bit. And maybe I am just a hater of the Chiefs. I think the Chiefs are, yes, the best team in the FC. But I don't think that they're – I'm not sold on the Chiefs yet. Put it that way. They, they, they lost the Lions on opening night at home. With their, two, with their second and third best player out. That's fine. <laughs> they, they, they beat the Jags. I don't know how good we think they are. They beat the Bears. They beat the Jets, who just lost Aaron Rodgers. With some, with some they, help with the refs. They, they, beat the, they beat the Vikings, who, fair and square, they did just beat the 49ers. Right. So I, I get it. You can always pick and choose, like, play the, 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 the algorithm game of who beat who. And then now they play the Broncos. They did have a good win against the Chargers. I will, I will continue to say I think the Chargers are a good football team. And then now they turn around. I don't know how – how do the, 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 the Chiefs do this every year where it feels like their schedule is relatively weak, but they win their division every single year. Because then they turn around, they play, they play the Broncos again, who's in their division, I guess. They played the Packers, I guess that's I, the Patriots. So I don't know. I mean, they play the Bengals and the Bills. It looks as if the Chiefs right there again are going to get home field advantage all the way through the postseason. We're going to have to hear about how great they are. Again. Yep. So get, you can get, take re- it to get, the bank. get ready for that. Take it to the bank. They're getting. But they are great. Advantage. They are a good. Team. Although Baltimore, you know, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Casey, buying or selling? I am going to buy. Yes. I'm going yes. to buy that they are not AFC contenders. Hit the button. Bye, bye, bye. <laughs> Love that button. <laughs> You're buying. I'm buying. I just they're they're uh, they're on my fraud watch. I mean they they play. They're just like the Bills to me. They play really well against bad teams. And they just don't show up against good teams. Simple as that. Yep, simple. They play they play a team that can get pressure on Tua, and their whole offense is just a, a sham. So. Okay. Now, to be fair, to be what? fair to this, Miami Dolphins shams. They <laughs> d- have not had Devon A Chain. I think that's what he likes to go by now. They have not had Devon A Chain for a couple weeks now. Maybe it's different with him in it, but well, they don't. They just without their dynamic run game tied with their dynamic passing attack. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna say that they are frauds. Okay. And Elliot, buy or sell it? Well, I, well, he just said that. Now I have to go look it up. Raheem Mostert, I'm pretty sure, leads the NFL in touchdowns. Yeah, he's got nine touchdowns so far. Yards-wise, I don't know how many that is, but that's a lot of yards. He's had three games over 100 yards. That guy's – they're elite. They have two elite running backs. One of them just happens to be hurt. But Raheem Mostert's one of the best running backs in the NFL as of this moment, as of right now, because they, that, that title does change a lot because of how uh, fruitless the position is, unfortunately for Trace. But – 
saying that, the offense is not fraudulent. They've destroyed everybody. So they've had a couple bad games. I wouldn't say they got obliterated by the Eagles. I'd say it was a decently close game uh, up until the end. But, yeah, I think the Dolphins are absolute legit. I'm selling that. That was a fraudulent claim. Sell, sell, sell. They play the Chiefs in two weeks. It looks like uh, be a big it game. has to be uh, overseas because it's at 930 in the morning. Yeah, yep, They're playing Frankfurt, the Frankfurt games. Wow. Love awesome. that They town. love sending teams from Miami. They love sending teams from Florida over to Europe to play football games. That's that is that one play. of the great towns in the world. Frankfurt, it- Kentucky? Uh, <laughs> well, there too. <laughs> But Frankfurt, they have the longest pedestrian-only street in the world of bars and restaurants. Awesome. It's the most incredible thing you have ever seen in your life. And I spent one great night there, many, many moons Uh-oh. ago. Uh-oh. Oh, All right. Wow. That should be the Come cherry on, on top. My name is Elliot. Come on. My name is Elliot Vigeta seen in Tom. See, I, I, I didn't learn the language. Well, I learned la- it's a beautiful language. It sounds really... That's what everyone says about German. It's- German, they said it's a beautiful nine, language. Nine, nine, nine. Uh, all right, yeah, I'm selling this as well because I don't... Just listen, no, I think out of the last two years, we've no. seen this Miami's Dolphins team. I think they're frauds. Trace brought it up that they get linked in with USC. I don't think that's a terrible um, comparison because this team... Listen, this year, everyone falls in love with them scoring 70 points against the Broncos. They fall in love with them scoring 42 points against the, the Panthers and 31 points against the Giants. Over the last two years, anytime this team has played a good team, they have not showed up. Last year, they were 8-3. and three. What happens? They play the San Francisco 49ers, lose. They play the Los Angeles Chargers, lose. Play the Buffalo Bills, lose. They then lose against the Green Bay Packers and lose against the, the New England Patriots to go to 8-8. Eight and eight. And you could say, well, what happened? Did their quarterback get hurt? No, their quarterback actually came back from injury during that stretch. Tua played every single one of those games. So this team, until I see them compete against the big dogs, okay. until I see them beat the Kansas City Chiefs, until I see them consistently beat the Buffalo Bills, which, I mean, you can say what you want. They're, they're one of the best teams in the AFC. They're highly inconsistent. Until I see those wins consistently stacking up against the best teams in the NFL, I don't think they're serious contenders. So you are a sell. Selling as well. All right. Sell, sell, sell. <laughs> right. Love it. All right, let's go. What's next? Another AFC team. The Chargers are done. Do you think the Chargers season is over? Do you think the Chargers will make the postseason, Tom? The Chargers are done. You buying or selling? Um, I'm selling that. You think sell, they still sell, got sell. a little life in them? Every game they've played this season has been within a uh, within single digits. Now, Other than I have last I have made yeah I have made the, uh, uh, the you know I, I've made the comments for years. I, I, I'm not a big believer in you know w- what happens a few times becomes a pattern. And for three or four years now, you can blame Staley sometimes, but Herbert's missing too many open receivers. Uh, he's missing touchdown throws no is what he's doing. He's got great numbers, and it looks all sexy when he's throwing for 350 and all that. But when he's got to hit that wide-open guy in the corner of the end zone, he's overthrowing him by seven yards. Having said that, I think that they, they play in a bad division. Kansas City is the only team that they shouldn't theoretically beat, right? They have lost to others, so, mm-hmm. you know, it's no slam dunk. But I think that you couple the, their division, their schedule the rest of the way – I think everybody's going to be bunched up together somewhere maybe in that nine-win range, somewhere like that, yeah. where a nine-win team gets into playoffs. So I'm selling. Hit the button, Case. Sell, 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 sell. Elliot, bring it over to you. You buying or selling that the Chargers are done? Well, Rita Rue, I'm going to buy it. I'm ah. going to buy it because the Chargers are done. They don't have a quarterback. They don't have any receivers. They don't have anybody. They also play in the Chiefs division, which is owned by the Chiefs. Unfortunately for the Chargers, their time has ended. I thank Brandon Staley very much for his many failures, and you can go on your way. Chargers, season over. See you later. Don't clip this. <laughs> yeah, I'm buying this as well before we flip it over to the other side of the room. And the reason I'm buying this is because wow. I think the AFC is so – I feel like a lot of it is already starting to, to, to lock itself up. The Kansas City Chiefs are going to win that division. The Jacksonville Jaguars are going to win the South. Either the the Dolphins or the Bills are going to win the East, but they're both going to make the postseason. You look at the AFC North, two teams from the AFC North are certainly going to make the postseason. That leaves one spot for about five different teams, and the Chargers at the very moment are on the outside looking in. 
So yeah, I'm buying that their season's done. I don't think they can overcome. I don't think this team can get back to 10-7 and seven at this very moment, especially with the way they've played over the past few weeks. Justin Herbert, I absolutely believe it. I think Justin Herbert's going to win a lot of games. I think he's going to be a Hall of Famer someday. He has all the talent in the world. I just don't think they're going to be very good this year. I'm buying. Yeah. Trace. I'm going to sell. I, I do think sell, the Chargers sell, sell. and the Bengals are very similar, though. And then the only difference is, is that the Chargers play in a weaker division, which allows them to have a weaker schedule. And those extra maybe two wins that you're going to get playing in their division versus the Bengals division yep. is going to probably be the difference. I had 10 wins. 10 wins definitely gets you into the postseason. Nine is questionable. Right now they have two. They have the Bears uh, on Sunday night. That's a win. That's three wins. They have the Jets. Um, that's a questionable. That then they play the Lions, the Packers, Ravens, Patriots, Broncos, Raiders, Bills, Broncos, Chiefs. I think out of all of those, they find a way to win. Uh, they they find a way to win ten games, maybe nine, and nine might get them in. So I'm not going to sell, or I'm not going to buy the idea that they're done. All right. Okay. So thinking they're going to go eight and three over their last fourteen, or what would that be? You've got to get to ten wins. So yeah, something like that. Uh, Casey. Yeah, I, uh, I'm buying. Bye, bye, bye. I'm buying this. Uh, without Mike Williams, that passing attack has looked really bad. Uh, Quentin Johnson looks like a bust at the current moment. He's not getting the ball whatsoever, and he was supposed to replace Mike Williams. Um, yes, they haven't really had Austin Eckler, um, but they had him the last two weeks, and they played the Cowboys and the Chiefs, and they just – they only scored 20 and 17 points. Mm -hmm. 20 points against the Cowboys was a bit of a, a, a fraud look because they were given the ball in the red zone on a muff punt. I'm worried about the, the Chargers offense. And not only just that, I think the Chargers defense just not very disciplined. I think they give up a lot of big plays. I think they cause a lot of penalties. No doubt about that. Um, I, I'm, I'm buying. I'm – I'm down on the Raiders or the the Chargers this season. Wow. Yeah, like like the point that I've made is just I think there's a lot of teams that are going to be fight, vying for those last couple wild card spots. They're not going to win the division, so they're going to have to be a wild card team. And I just think starting out at two and four, having to play the Chiefs again, they just they just aren't in a good spot. They're going to be on the outside looking in come the end of the year. Okay. All right, all right. All right. We'll, for this third one, we'll start with that side of the room because I know they're they're very fond of this guy. The 49ers should be worried about Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy has played bad his last two games. I know Casey is fighting that. He played well on Monday. I don't know how you can watch that game and think that. I know he completed 70% of his passes, but a lot of dinks, a lot of dunks. Um, the 49ers should be true. worried about Brock Purdy. Uh, no, the, the 49ers should not be worried about Brock Purdy. Sell. Sell. I'm selling. Sell, sell, sell. Uh, <laughs> Brock Purdy is going to get them in a position to win 13 games this season. So I, if that's something that to be worried about, to win this Sunday. No comment. Uh, oh no! No this, comment. No, no comment on it. Brock Purdy was twenty of thirty, twenty-one of thirty for two hundred seventy-two yards. The one bad moment or two bad moments happened on back-to-back -back drives, which is a little concerning. Yeah. But the most of the time, most of the time, the 49ers are going to be ahead of ball, of ball games. So I'm not too concerned about Brock Purdy and how he looked against the Vikings. I mean, he was he was throwing over the middle deep balls like 15, 20 yards down the field. I mean, what more what more yeah. can you want from a guy? I mean, yeah, yeah, he doesn't throw it 45 yards down the field, but you don't need that to have a explosive offense when you're chunking people for 10, 20 yards a game. Yeah. Fair enough. Trace buying, selling? No, I'm not I'm I'm selling the idea that they're going to worry about sell, sell, sell. Uh, they're they're in a position where the 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 49ers are, if you're a fan of the 49ers, or you're a fan of the Eagles, or you're a fan of the Chiefs, I think you're in the same boat. That boat is, you can go do whatever you want the rest of the year. If, if, if you have hobbies, you have things that you want to get out of the way, go do them. Don't even worry about watching the games, because the most meaningful games of the entire season are going to happen in, in, in the dead of the winter, when it's really, really cold outside, so you don't have to fret over these games. You just, you just do whatever you want. Uh, it's yesteryear's Patriots. It's yesteryear's Packers, per se. Doesn't mean you're going to win the Super Bowl, but you know you can book it. You're going to be in the playoffs. And uh, if you can do that, then you don't worry about your quarterback. Tom, let's flip it over to you. you buying or selling at the I am selling that all day. Sell, 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 sell. All day, every day. Shanahan, Purdy, they had never lost together until two weeks ago. They missed a field goal. They should have won the game in Cleveland. They're totally fine. Totally fine. Sell. Sell, sell, sell. Thank you. 
Elliot, start with you. Buy it. Buy it. Purdy is done. D U N done. Casey said the he only made two mistakes. Well, yeah, those two mistakes lost them the game. So it, it, it's tough to just point out. Did the you two. say they're done? No, I said Brock Purdy Brock is done. Well, if he's done, they're done. No, certainly yeah. not. That's a plug and play quarterback system. You just right. throw in anybody right. in there. You throw Jake Browning in there. Boom. They win a lot of games. That's just what the 49ers can do. I, I, I credit them for it. They've done a great job with it. Jimmy Garoppolo, Brock Purdy, Trey Lance, it doesn't matter who they throw in there. They'll win a couple games. So, yeah, I'd be a little bit concerned that your quarterback's choking in the big moments. I don't know. But that's, that's just me. That's my opinion. Okay. I mean, that's one game out of the whole season. Yeah. I, think, I think they should absolutely be worried about Brock Purdy. So it's not, a buy. It's a buy. It's a buy. buy and buy, the buy. reason I'm saying that isn't because I don't think Brock Purdy's a great quarterback. I'm saying that what they need out of Brock Purdy, Brock Purdy doesn't like to do. What they need out of Brock Purdy is someone that just gets it to their, you know, all their talent around them, just dinking and dunking, and let those guys run to the end zone. Brock Purdy does that, but then also likes to make some very risky plays. And for the first 11 games of his career, got away with a lot of it. Last two time, to- last two games he's played, he's made some very risky plays, and it's come back to bite him. Brock Purdy needs to <laughs> limit himself before he limits his team's championship probability. I mean, that's just propaganda. This, this is blasphemy. He had his team ready to win a ball game in Cleveland. The kicker missed it, okay? Well, yeah, I'll Jake give you, I'll give you the, the Vikings, but that's the only time he's not had his team in a position to win a ball game. One out of the entire career that he's had Well, so he only far. scored – how many points did he score in that game? Yeah, that's the argument you could make. How many points? But did he the score? Browns have a really good defense, so I mean, yeah, the, yeah. I, but but again, then the Colts. Gardner Minshew just put up thirty nine <laughs> points Colts, on like, on this Browns defense, right. While turning the ball over four times, so yeah. one for a touchdown. It's <laughs> also that's also relatively scary, though, if you're a Bengals fan, in my opinion, that, that the Browns found a way to f- win a football game when their defense was pretty putrid. So uh, you you could you could spin it both ways. Well, that's that's what I said that earlier in the week is that that is such a big win for the Browns because if if they lose that game to the Colts, that is such a gut punch. Instead, they win a game that they absolutely should not have won, and now they're sitting at four and two with a very easy schedule going ahead. All right, final buy and sell. Final buy and sell. Here we go. And how are we going to say they played bad? They scored a t- the defense scored a touchdown. <laughs> the Steelers can win the AFC North. I'm going to go ahead and jump out in front of this. This is absolutely a buy because. Whoa. This Pittsburgh Steelers team, they're already 4-2. and two. They go under the radar. What do the Steelers do? With Mike Tomlin, they go over 500 every year. I think the winner of this division isn't going to be a 13-game winner. I don't even think it's going to be a 12-game winner. These teams are going to beat each other down, and the Steelers are already 2-0 and in the division. Don't sleep on the Pittsburgh Steelers because this is absolutely a team that, that doesn't pop out. They don't score 70 points a game like the Miami Dolphins do. But what do they do? They go out and win games. What do they do? They go out and beat yeah. teams and get to four and two, and they go over 500 every single year. So, I, yeah, the it's Steelers absolutely buy. can buy. buy, buy, buy. It is true. They don't, they don't do anything right offensively. In fact, they've been outgained in every single game they've played this season. But if you were to believe in that, I certainly do not. If you were to believe in that, that's a take you can have. I say they can absolutely sell. Or, sorry, I'm going to say this is an absolute sell. sell they sell, cannot sell. win the division. There's no chance they win the division. They don't. They have no offensive weapons, none. Zero N, none. N-U-N, none. I think Kenny Pickett's a bum. I'm going to go around. Najee Harris, bum. Najee Harris doesn't even play anymore. That's, that, that's what kind of guy you got there. Uh, they do have George Pickens. George the Pickens is good. Draft pick George Pickens is good. I'll, 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 I'll defend George Pickens. George Pickens is all right. The rest of the team, Deontay Johnson has, has been hurt. And then you have uh, Allen Robinson, who's not been very good as well. Pat, Fr- Pat Fryermuth, he stinks too. Uh, Steelers cannot win this division under any circumstance. Now, it is Mike Tomlin, and they have never had a losing season, Tom. That's a real stat. That's right. They have never had a losing season under Tomlin, but nine wins doesn't win this division, and that's what I'm going on. Okay. All right. Trace? If I'm being completely honest, I've not watched the Steelers play hardly, but maybe five snaps on NFL Red Zone. So I've, I, I, it would be disingenuous of me to sit here and act like I know much about the Pittsburgh Steelers, but when I do watch their offense and I watch Kenny Pickett, none of that tells me that they are good they in, any, nice in, any, in any form or fashion. When I've watched Kenny Pickett, at one point in my life, have I thought, wow, that guy, that guy could get you to the Super Bowl. Uh, maybe he can. Again, I've not watched much, much of Kenny Pickett, but – I am uh, – I'm going to sell that. I don't sell, think sell, sell. North, no. So I had to take – before the season even started, way even before the preseason started, 
that the Steelers could be the team to look out for again for the, the Bengals in the AFC North. And I still agree with that. You look at their schedule. I mean, I'm not a believer in the Jaguars just yet. They play them this Sunday. That'll tell me a lot about the Jaguars this game. But then they play the Titans. That's easy. They play the Packers. Titans are easy. Yeah, Packers, easy. I mean, Browns, if yeah. you believe in them, that's going to be a tough ball game for them. They already beat the Browns once, so probably do it again. They play the Bengals. Cardinals, that's easy. Patriots, easy. Colts without Anthony Richardson, easy. Seattle Seahawks and that front, that offensive line, they're going to get feasted on all day. I'm not going to say that though that they're for sure shoeing's going to win, but I think they can compete. I think they can, so I'm going to buy. buy. Wow. I, I, Tom is very base. I'm going to let you get through your opinion, but I have a quick question to ask after you're done, Tom. You, you buying this? Uh, I'm buying like because I think they can win a lot of games 17 to 10. I think yeah. they can beat teams 20 to 17. I think they can. Their defense is that good. I buy. The one thing that, that you got to know about Kenny Pickett, he's not a very good quarterback, but he has started in 18 games. He has six game-winning drives. And one-third of his games so far in his career, he has, he has won the game. That's bordering game on it being a member of you-know-what. Yeah, that's a, that's a nut cutter, right? Well, it's close. That, it's close. And that's, that's the thing I, I would say about the Steelers team. I don't watch every snap they play, but I turn it on when it's late in the game, and I see Kenny Pickett make nice throws at the end of the game. I don't think he's a good quarterback, but I've seen him come down, down the wire. And yeah, win to say this Steelers. guy's a, a bust is just completely ignorant. He, he has not been very good, but yes, correct. But – the point is, is he's winning games. 11-7 and seven as a starter. I mean, that's the bottom line here. He's winning. He's doing well enough to win. No doubt. All no right. Doubt. Trace, what was your question? Well, I just – I find it fascinating sometimes in this room. And, I mean, Tom usually is very – really – pretty based with the Bengals sometimes so I feel like sometimes you're a little pessimistic on him but that's okay, okay. Yeah, that, that, that's fair, okay I fair. guess the question I have is I mean if, why would I be if we're concerned about Brock Purdy NFL. if we're concerned about Brock Purdy and we think the Titans are an easy win for the Steelers I didn't say that I know you didn't Tom all so right. I'm asking the room here are we not concerned about Joe Burrow at all and are we not concerned about the Bengals just aren't very good we are concerned about the Bengals offense because they have every piece to be good, and it hasn't shown its hand. But to ask if we are going to be worried at this moment of the season, coming off a, a few games where he's finally been healthy, coming off of back-to-back -back years where they've gone to the AFC Championship, coming off a, a Super Bowl run two years ago, if you're asking to worry about Joe Burrow when he's the best thing that I've ever seen in the franchise that I love my entire life, no, I'm not going to be worried about it. I'm gonna. It will take years for me to be worried about Joe Burrow in all seriousness. And I know that's not a bias. I know that is biased. I know that's not objective. That's okay. I'm just telling you where I'm at with the team. You have reason to be worried about uh, Joe Burrow, Elliot? Yeah, this is ugly. We're, I mean, if we asked about Justin Herbert, are you worried about Joe Burrow? We're we're nearly halfway through the very similar things with Justin Herbert and Joe Burrow going on right now. There's we're no nearly we're nearly halfway through the season, and the Bengals' offense has looked inept. So yeah, I, I'm I am concerned. We're, we're at the point, like, if, if, you, if you get blanked by the 49ers, like, the, you don't just get to turn it on and turn it off at ver various points during the year. You have to turn it on. You have to keep it on. And the Bengals have been off this entire season. So, we'll see. We'll see if they can, we, we'll see if they can figure it out. But as of right now, no. The, I, I, I am very concerned about Joe Burrow in the Bengals' offense. Casey, you're rolling your eyes. I'm, I'm not concerned about Joe Burrow. I mean, say what you want. I'm – Give, give him excuses. I mean, right. yeah, he hasn't looked good, but the difference between Justin Herbert and Joe Burrow is an injury. They have literally the exact same situation going on, though, right now. They both lost their number two receiver, Mike Williams and T. Higgins. Same size, same sort of roles. And their offense has taken hits. So say what you want, but really the real question should be, what about T. Higgins? That's what I'm more concerned about. If he doesn't show up, then the offense is clear. It's obviously not going to be what it was last year. He makes it – like that, that receiving core makes it super dynamic. But I'm not worried about this being like – if T. Higgins isn't the same, I'm still not worried because Joe Burrow is going to make it a, a top, what, 12 offense in the league instead of a top three. Not I don't worried. know, but Justin Herbert's uh... – uh, quarterback rating is uh, 65, which is not. I'm not, I'm, not, played, I'm, not, I'm, not played, I'm not saying, I'm not saying it should be the MVP, Tom, Joe. but uh, Joe Burrows is 40. So maybe it was just all because he was hurt. But I watched, a, I watched a game last week that Joe Burrow very much, 
the Bengals could have gone down the field and put the game away, and he missed three throws in a row. Joe, and they Joe went three and out. Look, Joe has Part not of the football. Joe, Joe Burrow would be a concern of mine if I was a Bengals fan. Now, it's I get it. It's one drive. <laughs> it's one drive. Casey, here's the thing, though. They're, like This is the part where you think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a troll here, and I'm not trying to be a troll. I'm just saying, That's like, I would have a little concern. Because of this, Joe Burrow got incredibly hot, right? He did. And I'll give him all the credit in the world for what he did the last two years in Cincinnati. But outside of that, it's not as if you know going forward that that Joe Burrow is going to be there going moving forward, period. Like, that's the part that I would be semi-concerned with he if did I were a Bengals four fan. years, really. I mean, he did at LSU, and then he LSU, had, he had, year, he had, he had arguably short, the, best, then... the best roster around him ever assembled in college football, yeah, with all due respect. The best numbers of all time. I mean, and I do want to, I want to clarify that's right. my that's, that's right. fair. That's right. I want that's to clarify right. my comment. I'm not worried about Joe Burrow going forward. I am worried about Joe Burrow this season. I'm worried about Joe Burrow this season. Okay. I'm not. I'm, I have no. I have no uh, uh, doubts of Joe Burrow's ability as a, as an NFL quarterback. That I'm just saying this season specifically. That's what I'm worried about. Okay. The Bengals have a weird devil magic to them about them too, right? They 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 win games that they shouldn't win That's consistently. Right. That's right, and, and he's he's a big reason why. And I don't know if he's the reason why. I don't know what it is, but there's something going on to where they constantly don't play well and walk out on the other side and win games. And I think the Bengals should get credit for that. That they played maybe the worst six game stretch since Joe Burrow has been a Cincinnati Bengal. And they're three and three. I, I, Lou Armadillo, you are. I'm, I'm with you all the way. Whatever up. it is, and I and I come down hard on him a lot, but I think what you just said is 100 percent accurate. The bottom line is they played six games. Quarterback hurt, wide receiver broken rib. Everybody has injuries, but the bottom line is they are three and three. Correct. Now that's it's good enough for dead last in your division, but I mean you know we're six games in. You got 11 left. 11 games left in this season. All right, we will get to your top five tomorrow. Okay. Can we do that? Yeah, absolutely. All right, and uh, uh, Ellie, I understand. Cherry on top. You have a cherry on top. That's right, I do. I, I, I saw this on, on the old Twitter last night or X.com, whichever you it's like. X, it's X. It's X. It's X. Okay. It's X. Um, so if you go on X, you're going to see a, a, a very intelligent baseball, baseball mind in Chris Mad Dog Russo. He always is shouting about the most intellectual things you'll ever hear. Well, on one of his shows, and one of his rants, he decided to say this. Day one. I, I, a, I'm stunned to beat Milwaukee. I thought they'd get swept by the Dodgers. I never thought they'd even go back to Philly for a game six. Uh, I'll, I'll try it one more time. I would not be stunned if they won tonight. I would be floored. floored. And I'll say this right now. Just to, I'll say this right now. And Bob Raceman, write it down. If they win the next two days, they win the next two games and win this series in seven games, if they win, I will, I will retire on the spot. I've been wrong in Arizona. All right, from so that's one. it. That's, so, that's a big, it's been a big story. Mad Dog Russo says right? he's retiring on the spot. I love that guy. The Diamondbacks. The Di- Have you met him? Yeah, I really like, him, like him a lot. Yeah, a lot. People might not like his television persona, but man, he is a good dude. What about Francesa? You like Francesa? I don't know him well. You don't know him? No. Mike I know who him. he is. I, do, I like Francesa a lot too. I, I like them both. But it is funny. He was like me. He bought into the Phillies hype. Unfortunately, came out the other side a loser. And that's what I am. I'm a loser as well. They almost swept him, Tom. It was almost there. Very close to a sweep. Very close to a Philly sweep. All right, we're working on a few things for uh, tomorrow. Uh, and we have Reed's list. We, that we know. That we know. But after that, uh, we're flipping coins around here. Casey, <laughs> started slowly, finished strong. Okay. Nice job. Thank you. Way to keep grinding. <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks, Tom. Way to go, Casey. Turn it around. I'm proud of you. See, all the other guys around here, they, they want to make jokes about it. I am sincerely proud of you. Started shaking. Casey, you, you don't deserve strong. this. Never hung your head. Casey doesn't deserve this, but I do find it hilarious. <laughs> Did what? This whole show, he's just killing him. <laughs> just <laughs> killing him, man. What are you talking just about? Killing killing him. Him. I just gave him a compliment. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's Casey what it is. That's like me after the. <laughs> that's like me after the game. I get all the, you know, I'm, I'm driving back home from a baseball game or something. I'm like, you know, hey son, you know, next time you need to do this, this, and this, and this. He's like. And he struck out four times, but you really look good on the last one. You keep it's a good foul tip. <laughs>
I, there is nothing further from the truth. I just said the guy started <laughs> Tom, slowly Tom. and he finished strong. Hey, Case, yeah. good going. Big That's boy. a thumbs up. That's good a Tom Redman thumbs up you just got. That's I right. did. That's I did right. get a thumbs That's up. That's right. That's right. Trace, always a pleasure. You know? You know what I'm going to do the rest of the day? Elliot, Reed? Yeah. What, what am I going to do? What are you going to do? What is that, Tom? I am going to spend the rest of this day in my car. Because inside of my house, I don't have a radio. <laughs> I'm going to spend the rest of my day inside of a car so I can turn on the radio and I can flip around. You don't have to do a lot of flipping around. Do some flipping around to find out what local radio station host are beating me down. That's what my rest Rather than enjoying a beautiful sunny day in Hamilton. I'm going to roll down the windows, um, <laughs> park my car in the driveway, get a 12-pack of beer, and just, you know, hear people just take me to task on local radio. <laughs> Sounds like a terrible day, Tom, <laughs> other than the 12-pack. All right, boys and girls. We have box lunch. Don't forget to like the, the, this stream and the next stream. Okay. We thank all of you for being with us. We look forward to seeing you. Tomorrow, for all of us here on Off the Bench, we thanks, thanks again for being with us. We'll see you manana. And right now, box lunch. Here we go. I must admit, I didn't think much of this show the first time I laid eyes on it.